And welcome back to HBP, the podcast that covers college basketball and the NBA draft inside now. I am Rich Harris, and I'm dying. Thank you for joining us again. <clears throat> this will be the last time you ever hear from me, because I'm choking to death. Um, so we're going to begin with, uh, we're going to continue with our mock draft uh, in this episode, doing picks uh, 15 to 30. But before we do, we're going to do a, a quick college notebook, a quick NBA chat. And um, we're going to start off with the latest uh, movement in the transfer portal. And the two guys we said were the hottest commodities in the portal, Grant left in the portal, uh, Grant Nelson and Arthur Coloma were actually signed. Uh, Grant Nelson is going to Alabama and Coloma is going to K-State. What do you think about these moves, Jake? Yeah, so Grant Nelson down to Alabama and Arkansas. Arkansas, don't believe they had any space left. I'm not really sure how that could work. Bama needs some guys, though. They're losing Noah Clowney. They're losing Charles Bediaco. So they get it, it, here, here's the thing, though. Bama's losing two guys that are probably going to get drafted. And they're going to bring in Grant Nelson, who's kind of a wild card. Some people thought he could get drafted, but he decides to come back. And it's a bit of a gamble here. I I believe in his game. I think he's a very good player. But at the same time, he was playing in the Summit League last year, and now he's going to be playing in the SEC. So we're going to see how that experiment works. And then with Arthur, Lu Arthur Kuluma going to K-State, really, really big get for them. They're losing Keontae Johnson. They needed a wing, and they got one in a really big way, and a guy who could get drafted next year. So despite losing Marquise Noel, despite losing Keontae Johnson, uh, Jerome Tang's actually done a good job bringing in some talent here. He brings in Tyler Perry to replace Marquise Noel, and he gets a guy in Arthur Kaluma who is going to have to fill the shoes of uh, Keontae Johnson. So really good job by Jerome Tang on that front. So what does uh, anyone have? I, I know, Cam, I know you're high on uh, Grant Nelson. Um, but anyone else have uh, thoughts on uh, Nelson, how he's going to do at Alabama? I was surprised he had decided to go to Alabama. I expected him to, to still stay somewhere mid-major. Uh, he's going to take his athleticism to a very, very physical league that can expose him. Um, maybe that's what he wanted to do. Maybe that was his thing with regard to uh, impressing NBA scouts and taking his game to the next level. But uh, I didn't expect him to go to Bama. I didn't see him go in SEC. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, I, I, I don't know where he's from. Anyone know where he's originally from? Um, I believe he's from North Dakota. And that's oh, is he? Why yeah. he ended up going to school he's from that too. region. Okay. He's from that region up there. How, how, that's kind of odd, um, but you know what? Alabama is one of them. Was one of the more successful schools last year. We know they have room because they also lost. Uh, you know, lo losing Brandon Miller. They're losing uh, Jaden Bradley. Um, so and and I lost a couple other guys too. So they should have they got the kid from. Uh, they got Estrada though from. Uh, Hofstra. from the Hofstra. Hofstra. Yeah. yeah, Hoster, thank you. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So Mongolian Mike, uh, I think we announced this on the last show, was headed to San Francisco, but we really didn't talk about it except make a couple of jokes. But uh, <laughs> do we do we have any analysis about San Francisco? To me, um, this kind of seems like a lateral move. Um, yeah, I mean, that's my alma mater. Um, you know, I think the move for Mike does make sense. I know in things I was reading, he – wanted to go to an area where I think culturally there is a really big kind of Asian community here in the Bay Area. It probably was, a, it, it, they were saying that it seemed like a comfortable fit for him, which I do understand. I can only imagine what it's like coming all the way across the world and getting stuck in Dayton in the middle of the country. <laughs> uh, so I think it's a good fit from just, I from his comfort level. And then playing wise, I mean, recently, this was the biggest transfer that I can think that they've gotten uh, recently. So I think program wise, it's a good get. And I, I do like his game. Um, I completely disagreed with his choice to enter the draft. I thought it was a waste of one of his three um, declarations. Uh, to me, there was there's no way he was going to get drafted. But I, I still think there's a lot to like about his game with kind of that point forward type style. And I think this is a, from a competition standpoint, yeah, I, I think it's a relatively lateral move. I mean, obviously, he's going to have to deal with St. Mary's and the Zags. So the top half of that league is, is very competitive. But I think... Night in and night out, he has the chance to be one of the better players 
and then, you know, try to land himself on a, an all conference roster. So I, I like the move. I think in all facets, it, it, it makes sense. Um, you know, USF has been trying to capture some of that Todd Golden magic ever since he left. And a player like this helps move them in the right direction. Um, this does not make them a big threat in the WCC. That's just what it is. But right. Right. He makes them better. He does make yeah, them better. Yeah, he, he could be an all conference player. Uh, I don't yeah. think that's without, you know, not out of the realm. Um, all right. So DeMarco Dunn, who's a, uh, was a freshman, I believe last year, a red shirted, uh, top 70 recruit, uh, a wing is going to Penn state. Penn state continues to add some pretty good pieces. What'd you think about this move, Jake? Yeah. I, I like the team that Mike Rhodes put together. I'm telling you, when we look back on this hiring cycle, I think he'll be one of the best ones that came out of this. The guy wins everywhere he goes. Uh, one at VCU, I think his his style that he wants to play, his defensive style to get after you, get up and down the floor is 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 going to pay off and is, is going to win a lot of games there. So it's a second UNC guy they've got. They obviously got Puff Johnson too, but I I, I think this they're going to be competitive next year. The Big Ten is still going to be good. Obviously, Michigan State's going to be very good. Uh, Purdue is bringing back Zach Eady, but I think this team's going to be competitive. They're not going to shoot at the Ohio level that State's last year's really team good. did. Say it again. Ohio State's going to be really Yeah, good. Ohio State brought in some guys. I, they're not going to shoot the ball like Penn State did last year. It's going to be a totally different team than you saw last year. They're going to play defense. I like the athletes. I like the guys they brought in. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm i telling you, I like Mike Rhodes. He's a PA guy. We're going to look back on this and say it was one of the best hires of, of this cycle, and he had to bring in a completely different team. We'll have to see how they gel together. Uh, but, yeah, DeMarco done rounds out his roster. Uh, I think he brought in one international recruit. He got a couple guys to stay. And outside of that, he had to bring in a lot of new players. So they're going to have to learn on the fly here. But I think they're going to be competitive. And Mike Rhodes is going to be one of the best hires of this cycle. Right. Bigger question is, that is UNC's seventh transfer out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is going on at UNC that is making seven kids at one of maybe the most prestigious college basketball institutions Believe. They got to rid themselves of last year. Yeah, yeah. That's what I just think it is. They got to rid themselves of it. Got to remove that, that stench. Get it, it, and if that, I like the guys they brought in. They're going to be significantly better yeah, next year. That Ingram in um, from Stanford wasn't much, but you know, right now that, and that seems to be their best, um, their best transfer that came in, which yeah. again, Ingram. Harrison Ingram, your best friends were coming in, you got an issue. But they did have a good recruit plus, like they always do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they landed a couple of good guys. Uh, the, did they get the kid from Louisville? Uh, yeah, Withers. Withers. They got Jalen Withers. They got yeah. Cormac Ryan. And I think Paxson right. Wojcik from Brown will be a nice piece for him. So he's a good player in the Ivy League. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the cupboard's not not bare. But your point, point taken, Booney, the – did a lot of people left, but I think I think Jake's right. It was just a, a real disaster there last year. So, um, all right. So Jordan Brown, <laughs> a player I know Booney uh, likes his game. A uh, former uh, McDonald's All American, uh, five star guy. He has played for three different teams in four years and put his name in the portal again this week. So I, I, I don't even know, is he going to get a waiver? I mean, why not just turn pro at this point? He, he did go into the NBA draft, pulled out. Um, it's just really not a good look to be transferring all these times. Uh, and I, he, I, look, he did have to go through two coaching changes. Like he get so he's the highest recruit in the his he's the, the highest rated recruit in the history of Nevada's program. Right. Must leaves. He goes to Arizona, which ends up being Sean Miller's last year. Tommy Lloyd comes in. So I think he he's good on that front. I don't I'm not gonna knock him for the first two transfers, but then like you're gonna leave Louisiana in the middle of June. You just made the tournament. Like I don't I don't if, and for what reason? Yeah. Like he's gonna play there, so I, I, it'll be interesting to see yeah, if it's yeah, a waiver yeah. here. This is really late to be leaving. 
yeah, he was an all conference player. He had a great season. Um, yeah, uh, really weird, but uh, you know, traditional big. But I, I guess he can he can hit s- some shots. Can he? He can hit a jumper now and again. Booney. Yeah, he's definitely I mean, he 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 can definitely fake the basket uh, and take it to about seventeen feet, and he can put the ball on the floor uh, as well and finish up the hoop. Uh, he's a good player. Um, I think I think his really good deal, really good rebounder. Um, I think his whole deal is hey, let me up my competition a little bit and try to make some sort of splash or. Uh, some sort of. Uh, well, the only thing, the only thing I would say about that is he, he, had, he, he went down a level each time he transferred. He, you know, Arizona, then Nevada, then Louisiana. So yeah. Now he's going to go back up again. I, I don't know. All right. So another mystery is Paul McKay leaving Rutgers, and man, that talk about a bear cupboard. Woo! Rutgers is going to take their lumps next year, I think. Um, so Paul McKay, he follows Cam Spencer into the portal. Didn't see this one coming. I, I feel bad for Steve Peichel, man. To lose Paul McKay he and, and Cam Spencer like that, where they were right on the cusp of making the tournament. You could run it back. You get Cliff Amore back. Mm. I, 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 I feel bad for the guy because um, I really like Steve Peichel as a coach. He's done a really yeah. good job turning around Rutgers. But to lose these guys and now, like, I, Derek Simpson played well. The end of last year, uh, they uh, you know that you got Andre Hyatt, but you know it's like okay, Noah Fernandez is going to step in, who was in and out of the lineup with injuries last year at UMass. Oh, um, and I don't env- I don't envision him being you know like one of the best guards in the in the Big Ten. So it it sucks. I like Steve Peichel as a raw deal, um, and I've been seeing stuff. Maybe Mulcahy to Indiana. Like, look, he's ah. an experienced guard, played in the Big Ten. He's going yeah. to be in high demand. He's going to probably go power five. Xavier, um, Xavier Johnson won't be happy to hear that, but uh, it definitely, I think, would be an upgrade for Indiana for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I said that would even suck even more if he if he left to go in, in conference. <laughs> but, yeah, Rutgers, Rutgers has taken, it's taken lumps, and it's like the last two weeks you think you're good, you think you have your team for next year, and then all of a sudden you're going to lose two starters. It's, yeah. And two okay. starters who could be potentially all conference too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all right. So uh this week the international players had the withdrawal and also the special circumstances players, you know, players like uh in Ignite or are not Ignite, but in playing in the G League or so forth. Um and so what we have is uh the the two most prominent, I would say, are Nikola Dursic. Uh, who was in second round range, definitely on our draft board. Bobby Clitman, who some people had in the first round range, but we didn't, we had him outside the draft. Um, Usman uh, Njai, uh, who was top 100 on our draft board. Uh, Michael Sacito, and also top 100 on our draft board. Uh, Tice DeRitter who we interviewed a few weeks ago, and Quinn Ellis, who we interviewed a few weeks ago. All those guys pulled out of the draft. And they're really, you know, it's kind of funny when you look at the international early entries, there's only like seven or eight in total. Yeah. Um, so how about that? Uh, any any comments on those withdrawals? By the way, Bobby Clitman is going to play in Australia. So we wondered why he didn't work out at the Combine. I, I, I'm guessing that he kind of had an idea, maybe was even signed by Australia when the Combine rolled around. We wondered why Why are you in the draft and invited to the Combine don't show up? Um, I, I'm thinking maybe he already knew he was going to Australia. Um, but any comments on these guys? I will say this. I found it interesting when talking both to Tice DeRitter and Quinn Ellis. Both of them on the show readily admitted they were going to pull out of the draft, that they were just doing it to get some feedback. Uh, Tice even went so far as to say is, nobody knows who I am. Maybe they'll take a look at me when they see my name. You know, he just wanted people to take a look at him. Um, They're both really good players. Uh, and I think both of them could be on our draft board, the top 100 next year. Um, one more note, and we've talked about Grant Basile probably more than we ever expected, but 
Grant Basile stayed in the draft, which I found curious. He could have taken the same route that Bobby Clintman took, and that is, or Isaiah Mosley is going to take, uh, and that is he is uh, signed to play in Italy, um, and he could have pulled his name out of the draft, played in Italy, and then put his name back in the draft next year. Actually, it would have been automatic entry next year. But he chose to uh, keep his name in the draft. I, I, you know, that's to me, you got nothing to lose by pulling out and going back in next year because you're not getting drafted. So who knows? Maybe you go to Italy ne next year and just knock it out of the park and maybe, you know, you become a second round pick. But he chose not to do that. And I don't understand that. Any ideas why that might be? You, you don't know what kind of. I think his situation is definitely going to go play overseas. I don't think he thinks he's going to get drafted. But you don't know what kind of opportunities he may have overseas. Well, uh, I do. I do. He signed He signed to play in Italy. He's already signed. But, well, up. As far as contract was, right? Do right, we know that? Right. It's two you years. Two-year two year contract. Okay. And what's it, do you know what the floor is worth? No. No. That, that's the whole thing. And, and um, being where he's from – so forth, and his personal preference. College is an easy sometimes to play. Go into classes uh, if you just want to play basketball. It, it's it's not easy. It is a full time job. It is eight nine hours a day of class, practice, film, study hall, and what they have to do as far as their grades have, is elevated compared to everybody else. So. It is not easy whatsoever being a college student. You play. Um, and if somebody wants to take a different route, I think that's a personal preference. I get it. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of my take on it. No, I, I do too. But I, I, I'm just saying that he – all he had to do is, you know, tell the NBA I'm pulling out of the draft. And he's not getting drafted this year, but who knows? Maybe next year he has a fantastic year. Maybe he's in second round consideration. Who knows? Uh, but he's taking that off the table by keeping his name in the draft now. Where I I, I feel very confident to say I haven't even seen Grant Basile get any workouts. So actually, I I know for a fact he's in Italy. Uh, I know that for a fact. Um, so yeah, why? I don't know, but all right. Um, and that wraps up our short mini version of the college notebook. And uh, hopefully Doc will join us and we'll have a short mini NBA chat. All right, Doc has joined us. Uh, so we can get on with our NBA chat section of the show. Tampa right now. Oh, ah. so, yeah. You're in the Tampa airport? Yeah, I'm at Tampa. I'm leaving to go back to Philadelphia right now. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Speaking of being uh, different areas, Cam today was at the championship parade for the Nuggets in downtown Denver. So we're going to get a firsthand report. How was the parade, Cam? Man, it was wild. Uh, people were throwing, you know, beer cans up to the stage. I'm pretty sure Bruce Brown and Mike Malone were drinking uh, Fireball, like the little shooters, on stage, like mid-speech. It was it was a really good time. And weren't you hanging out with associates of the owners? Uh, yeah, I have a friend. Uh, of course, like the Nuggets are owned by Crunky Sports, um, and they own a bunch of teams here in the Denver area. They own the Avs. They own the local MLS team. Um, and my buddy actually works for the MLS side of KSE. So they had like a little, little VIP area. We were hanging out, watching the show. And, uh, anything, uh, funny or interesting, uh, happen or, or did you, well, so me, and anyone buddies, famous? me and my buddies had a bet on who would be this year's equivalent of J.R. Smith, like, like famous Henny J.R. Smith, um, <laughs> And I was really shocked to see that this year, I think it was Mike Malone. He was on one. He was cussing into the stadium or into the fans. He was just, he was going in. He like randomly pulled up Uncle Jeff, uh, Jeff Green to do a speech. And Jeff was not like ready oh, for that at all. 
He just wanted him to talk. <laughs> Wait, but was Green was Green sober? Or? None of them were sober. <laughs> None of them. <laughs> Christian Brown shirt off was just like outside on the stage before any of the other players showed up, just like taking it in. Um, so what's the, what's the cola? What's... People throwing beers. I think Jokic's wife actually got hit with a beer because oh. they were throwing them up onto the fire truck. Um, tons of yeah, just tons of crazy moments. So, what's Nicola like uh, with a few in them? Oh, think... he was having a good time. Like, uh, if you're on NBA Twitter at all, like people were making a big deal out of how you know post game he was like, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. And uh, he he was the first actually to KP up on the stage. Uh, he was like, no, I, I want to do another fucking parade. You know, like classic, classic uh, Jokic vibe. Well, the, I think they're going to have a parade for him in Serbia. Uh, oh, they, as well. Sure yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, the way I hear it is there's, he hasn't made a final decision on whether he's playing in World Cup. But it's looking somewhat doubtful, which is a shame for Serbia, though he might. I heard there's also a possibility that he might skip the first couple of rounds and then show up for Team USA. <laughs> um, so we shall see. Uh, I mean, Serbia, I mean, it's a shame. I mean, he's the best player in the world right now. I'd love to see him play in the World Cup. All yeah, right. Serbia has a good team, too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, speaking of Mike Malone, I can't believe he came. He he acting like he's um what's that quarterback on the Vikings when they put the chain on him? What's Kirk Cousins, he, Kirk he, he Chains. I see Mike Malone with the Cuban link chain. I'm like, what is going on? This is in Denver. Yeah. Like they these guys think they they um Miami Heat is somebody. Hey, they was outside. Congratulations, <laughs> though. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it was nice to uh, an organization that hadn't won it before uh, won it. So that's great. So, do we have any any final thoughts on the finals? I think it pretty much played out the way we thought it would. Um, but one question I want to ask you: that seems a lot of people are saying now because most of the players are locked up, you know, for a few years contract wise, that this could be the start of a dynasty. So I guess that's my question. Uh, going out to you guys, do you think uh, we're going to see Denver in the finals on a regular basis? Doc? <laughs> um, I'm not a Denver Nuggets guy. Congratulations on your first championship. But I don't think the way how the NBA is going now, um, I don't think it's going to be like repeat champions it's like all the time, like the way Golden State ran it or how LeBron James kept going back. I think now the teams are definitely more even, though. They might have just like how the um, Milwaukee Bucks won their first championship, that they might go through that. You know, just because they, they're young and they still the core is still there. You know, th this was their easiest path this year. They were no one seed. They, um, the teams they played was teams that they was all favor against. There was no hiccups. There was nobody really match was a matchup chaos for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the Suns, for, for example, you know, they lost eight. And, and CP3 in a way, you know, that's kind of big. Losing CP3 is even bigger. But, you know, they go, and, and Suns is kind of like a new team, so now Suns will be back. Um, you don't know, the Lakers, the Lakers did like an incredible run, but they was always struggling throughout the whole season. And then they didn't get to play Golden State, and I, I feel like Golden State probably would have been like their hardest matchup, matchup-wise. Right. But, you know, it's always styles make fights, and I think they won a championship, but it's hard for me to call them a dynasty yet. So, you know, you win again. Think about it. Golden State won that first championship. They didn't really turn to the dice until they got KD again. You know, they, they lost that second year, even though they went 7-3 and 9. They still went there, but they lost. So, it's hard. It's not It's not easy. It's not easy doing what Golden State did. It's not easy doing what LeBron James, Miami Heat did. So, we're, we'll see. Yeah, and they also avoided playing Boston and Milwaukee. So yeah, you're right. Everything sides. everything kind of fell into place for an easy run. Um, so you guys, uh, Cam or Drew, you have any any thoughts along those lines? I definitely see this team. Uh, I think Doc's right. I don't think we're going to see like a Golden State run where they go to like three or four straight finals. It's just so tough to do. And 
you can it's hard to say with sports but i definitely see this team i would say in the next three years i wouldn't be shocked if they won another one i think this team is young i think they're loaded Jokic is the best player on the planet i think the only guy that's really a threat to that title uh on a yearly basis is Giannis, and Giannis has definitive weaknesses i don't think Jokic does Giannis can't shoot he's not a great free throw shooter yeah, Jokic is an elite defender, but he's a smart player. He moves in the right spots, gets where he needs to go. So do I see them being like on a three, four-year tear where they're in the finals almost annually? Probably not. It's just hard to do. But would I be shocked if in the next two seasons, if they win one of the next two titles? No. I mean, they're loaded. They're young. I think there's only room to improve for guys like Jamal Murray to increase his production into a regular season star. Uh, same thing with Michael Porter. Aaron Gordon has found the perfect home and the perfect role. Um, I know... Rich, you have a question on here and how important it is to keep Bruce Brown. Uh, I do think it's important, just like chemistry-wise, a la how the Warriors made it an emphasis to keep Iguodala, Sean Livingston, those key bench guys. But, you know, if Bruce Brown does take off, I think they have a great replacement in the wings in uh, Christian, in um, Brown, Braun, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> I think I think he's ready and show that, like, he's only going to get better and that he's a winner where he goes and he can absorb minutes right away as a rookie. So this team will definitely probably – be in contention for the next three or four years, and I would not be shocked if they won one uh, within the next two seasons, two or three. Cam, Cam is a Nuggets fan. Wait, hold on. I asked Drew the question. Does, does that make them a dynasty, though, Drew? Oh, a dynasty? Yeah, man, I don't know. I, dynasty, I think to be a dynasty, you've either got to win three straight or you got to win, like, five and ten like five and championships across the ten. Like you got to be like, like you can't just like back to back doesn't make you a dynasty. The bad boy Pistons weren't a dynasty and they went back to back and went to three straight. And I don't consider them a dynasty. So if they win, I'm going to say no. I think being a dynasty in today's NBA is so hard. I mean, it took the Warriors forming probably the most talented team ever to do it. And I, I don't, dynasty is really tough for me. They'd have to win like three and five, five and 10, something like that for me to really be like they're a dynasty. Yeah. I agree with that. So, Kim, Mike, go ahead. I, I, what I was going to ask you is what I asked you yesterday. I told you to think about this. You know, in terms of how important Bruce Brown is to that team, if you had, to, I, I think we would agree, Jokic first, Murray second, but is Bruce Brown third? Mary Gordon, I would say, is pretty clearly the third most important player. Um, going down the line, I would put. Bruce Brown and KCP at about about the same level of importance to the team. Um, I think MPJ just for his his upside as a creator and a shooter. You know, when he's when he's playing well, when he's having a good game, he's I would say even as high as Gordon. He can sneak up into that third most important. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you guys should have seen him at the parade today. I think if they. If they like carted out a contract for him, he would have signed it on the spot. Right. Um, yeah, he was he was like chanting, "I'm not going anywhere." You know, <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. And as uh, I said, as I said to you yesterday, two or three weeks from now, he'll sober up and, and look at his financial realities. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I mean, I I think the the benefit, um, you know, even if they're unable to re-sign him. He, he ends up taking the money, taking the check somewhere else. I think they'll have a pretty easy time tracking down guys that want to play in their system, yeah. uh, play with Jokic. You know, it's going to be a competitive team. As far as, like, the dynasty question, you know, I don't want to jinx anything, but to me they kind of remind me of the, the Spurs in that, you know, maybe they're not there every year, but they're always going to be a competitive team that's in the mix to get there. Um, and I think the way things are lining up in the West right now, they're by far the most solidified team. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Even the Suns, I can see they could have a real high peak, but they've got a lot of roster questions to figure out before they can really be considered a contender. Um, the Lakers are on the way out, probably, um, with LeBron getting older. Um, the Mavs are in disarray. Um yeah, I mean, outside of that, there's not a ton of teams. Sacramento, uh, Golden State Sacra again. Maybe Sacramento yeah. turns out to be their biggest rival. Yeah, and if, if if the Sacramento Kings are your biggest rival in the conference, you're doing something right. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um, 
Yeah, they, no, I think they, they've got a real shot at repeating, especially since they've got so many guys signed. There's some real continuity there. Um, but, I mean, again, like, these guys are young. Jokic is, like, 28, I think, um, which is hard to believe. But, uh, no, I mean, they've got a real window here to win a couple chips. Yeah, agreed. All right, today was Victor Wambayama's last game of the season. The season ended today. They lost. They were swept in the French finals 3-0. They had a lead today all game up until, the, like, the last two minutes, maybe. Uh, I think they got tied around the three-minute mark. And, yeah, then uh, Monaco hit a couple threes. Anybody anybody watch the game? No, but um, how many points he scored? I have no idea. No idea. Every game I used to watch of him, when I was forced to watch him at the NBA, NBA app, he would never perform well. He would have 12 points, 6 points, 8 points. Some games he might get 20. He was not dominant in no game I watched. I don't know. He, he always, his team, every time I watch, always lost. They probably won one time out of like 6 games, 7 games I watched. One game. So I don't know about it. I see the potential. The potential. But, man, I don't know, man. I don't see dominance yet. I don't see no I got dominance. The, uh, I got the ball. Two on six of 11, nine free throws. What was the total? Them, what was the seven total rebounds, point? four blocks? What was the total points? 22. Yeah. Nine, yeah he, nine looked, of he looked like he was playing well today. I didn't see a lot of uh, Kulabali um, in the game. Um, now, I wasn't watching from start to finish, I was kind of doing other things, checking in. And um, by the way, NBA app. Yeah. You can basically only get it if you have a tablet or a phone. They don't make it available if you have a computer, which also eliminates a lot of smart TVs. Um, so you have to have like a special smart TV to get the NBA app. And they started They started the game today. They played the first quarter on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, great. I don't need to watch this on my phone, which I don't want to do. I don't want to watch basketball on my phone. Um, and... <laughs> And then they stopped at the end of the first quarter and said, if you'd like to watch the rest, uh, download the free NBA app. <laughs> I'm like, you mother. <laughs> I can't believe they did that. They showed the first quarter and then stopped. So I ended up, ended up watching it on some pirated channel that was from Greece. So I watched Greece, Greek TV. <laughs> but uh, it was all Greek to me. Um, all right, we'll move on. We got... got Couple of trade scenarios I wanted to run by everybody. Um, and two kind of to me seem to be linked. Uh, we talked about the Trailblazers last week, and apparently we were talking about the number three pick and what they could do, because apparently they want another star to go with Dame Lillard, and apparently they're sh shopping the number three pick and Anthony Simons for a star player. In the meantime, another rumor that's really getting a ton of traction is the Pelicans are looking to move up in the draft and to take some of their picks and one of their star players, maybe Zion, maybe Brandon Ingram, to get Scoot Henderson. Now, it seems to me it's not a lock you can get Scoot at the number three pick, but since Houston's willing to trade that third pick, I think Charlotte and Portland should be talking, but what do you guys, uh, Doc? What, what do you make? What do you make of this? Uh, Simon's in the number three pick for a star. Is that enough for Zion or Ingram? Um, I don't, I don't know. So Zion, let's say let's start with Zion first. Zion situation, you know, even he, he got weight problems, got injury problems, he got hooker problems. <laughs> It's like, how can you, is this, and honestly, yeah, Zion's down there when he plays. But he's only playing 30 games a year. So what is his true value? And I think sometimes as even NBA fans and reporters, analysts, we could like overrate a guy based off of what we know he should be. You know, Zion had a, like a lot of LeBron hype coming in. And he never li he's not living up to that LeBron height. So now that LeBron status is over, he's not ever going to get to that status. As we can see, he already missed too many years of basketball. But what is his 
actual basketball work. Well, you got to treat him as a guy who's going to play 40 games a year. You got to treat him as a guy, yeah, when he plays, he might average 25 points and be dominant, but we don't know that. We don't know if he's going to play. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind trading the third pick for him because he was a former number one pick. And Simons is like, okay, you don't want Simons anyway because you don't like the backcourt. So it's like you're just giving them and you take that money off. So I would do it if I'm the Blazers. Um, what I do if, if I'm the Pelicans, I would do it if I'm the Pelicans also. You know, I feel like the Zion experiment is not going to work. He, he never wants to play in New Orleans. Let's remember, he wants to be somewhere else as a New York Knicks. So he, really, he never liked in New Orleans. He's not giving you 100% of basketball for it, honestly, because he doesn't really doesn't play for you guys. I think I think in the last three years, I don't know if he even played 100 games. I have, I have to look. It, it, it's really a bad number because of how many games he played the last three years. But I, I, the Zion experiment, I think you should just trade him and get what you can. That The young guy, I would probably drive Brandon Mella if I'm getting Simons already, and I already got um, um, McCollum. But you can't go wrong with either um, the third pick, whoever you want at third. Whoever's available. You can't go wrong, in my opinion. Right, right. Well, apparently, you know, they want Scoot. So they want to, they don't consider McCollum a true point guard, and they want a true point guard. So, um, so yeah. assignments will have to come off the bench then. He'll be a six man. Right, right. Yeah. So, what do you, what do you guys make of uh, the Pelicans and Trailblazers rumors? Okay. Um, I've been really, I've been thinking about, this exchange as a Dame destination. Like, see, I could really see, for me, the Trailblazers aren't really in a position where they should be trading away a top three pick, especially for somebody as with as much upside as either Miller or Henderson. I think their timetable is truly trending towards it's time to trade Dame. Um, let's see if we can get a quality player back that's a really good destination for somebody like Zion. Get a little change of scenery, get him away from that good Southern cooking. You know, um, hell, he might even become a vegan if he's up in Portland. That'd be perfect. Um, but I just, I and the Pelicans have a couple of picks, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that, you know, you, you, you could swap those in the Dane trade. Um, and Portland can really dig into their rebuild you know, start off with one of those top three guys and, and fill in some more talent around the bottom of the track. Cam, I will say this about the rebuild. They can't rebuild until Dan says we're part of the trade. That's their problem. So the, the positive side is that you can't just trade Dan without Dan saying, oh, let me, because he, Dan came out as a guy, you know, I love being here, I want to win here. So now the positive side is you can't just, that look bad on your franchise. You just trade Dame. It's not a, it's not a good. The guy who embraced your city, you can't just trade. So if less Dame requests a trade, they're not going to rebuild. So that's, I think that's why they, they're looking to do it this way. But Dame been hitting that. He's going to request a trade by all these talks about what teams you want to go to. So, but if I'm Dame, he got to make a decision before draft day. Are you going to actually trade or not? You got, you don't wait until the middle of the season, the middle of the, um, the off season. Because not, you're not going to get traded that way. So you might as well ask for it now if you want to trade. Or if not, you're going to stay here, and then they're going to try to build around you by getting Zion or getting Brandon Ingram or trading that third pick. Because they're going to trade that third pick if they stay. Definitely. Well, I just think it makes sense as a destination. You get to, like, granted, the McCollum-Lillard backcourt has its own issues, but... One of the big problems with that Blazers team was always that they never had a wing that was worth anything, right? But now they're going to be if – you, if you're looking at reuniting them in New Orleans, you've got wing defenders like Dyson Daniels, Herb Jones, and you'd probably be keeping Brandon Ingram as well. So you've got a real core of talent there and a hell of a score in Dane Lillard. That's going to be his opportunity at, you know, ring chasing. Um but uh, and then on the flip side too, if you're Portland, you know you're you're trading Dame, but you're getting back this sort of tantalizing prospect in Zion, uh, given his issues. But you know when he's healthy, 
he's an all-star and with without any real development time right? he just kind of rolls out on the court and puts up 20 and 10. he literally rolls oh shit. yeah <laughs> All right. So uh, my feeling is if Portland was smart, they would hold on to that third pick and trade Dame, not be looking to get rid of Simons and the number three pick. Um, so that's my opinion. All right. Last question. We're running out of time here. Um, and I, I basically want to get your opinion. Is this one of the worst all time trade proposals in the history of the history of NBA draft rumors? Uh, Jonathan Gavoni suggested that the Pistons trade Bogdan Bogdanovich to the Mavericks for Tim Hardaway Jr. in the number 10 pick. Who on Dallas would go for that? Well, I, don't, I don't get it. Would it be a sign and trade? Does he ain't Bogdanovich a free agent? No, no, he's not. But why? Why would why would the Mavericks? Why would the Mavericks do that? Is Bogdanovich that much better than Tim Hardaway Jr.? No, I, I like him. I like him. I like him way better than. But the number ten pick? No, not the number ten pick, though. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's that to me is a trade that's never going to fly. Hor- this is a horrible. Yeah, this is. I think that the the Bogdanovich Hardaway. I agree with Doc. I lean Bogdanovich, but I don't think the gap is so big to give up a top 10 pick and a pretty loaded draft for a team that's already scrambled. Like the, the Mavericks are, to me, are a non factor until like further notice. They'll win games if they do resign Kyrie. They're just talented. But does, any, does anyone think the Mavericks are going to beat consistently the Nuggets, the Kings? If the Lakers run it back, I don't think they're better than the Lakers still. I don't think they're better than the Warriors, depending on what they do, still on a night-in, night-out basis. So, I mean, the only thing that sucks about this is why, like, how am I not famous? I can probably trade like this, like, randomly. I'll, uh, like, I'll trade Kaminga in the 19th pick for Anthony Davis. <laughs> can I be, like, viral now? Like, what? This is horrible. This is horrible. But, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I don't get paid Who by said that? Uh, Jonathan oh. Gavonis, the ESPN's draft expert and draft Rumor guy, uh, um, he does good, he's people good jobs, man. Just to say propaganda today, I'm telling you, <laughs> propaganda. Yeah. I, I, I would think that you'd get a lot better player just straight up for the number 10 pick. I also think that if you were going to do this trade, it would be at best a late first rounder, at best. Yeah. So. Yeah, and this this trade to me smells like somebody in the Pistons front office was they're they're, they're clearly like shopping Bogdan right. or Bojan, sorry, right? Um, but you know they they're kind of snickering to each other like, hey, somebody text Gavoni. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're exactly. Trying to, trying to inflate the value. Right. Know? Right. And one of those negotiating tactics where you start in an unreasonable number and then you work your way down to something reasonable. Oh yeah, they'd be thrilled if they if they got Hardaway and maybe like I don't know one of the Mavs later picks. They'd probably be if they want. They'd probably be thrilled. Well, yeah. Well, the Mavs don't have a later pick. Uh, I thought they had a later. Oh no, they don't. You're right. They don't. They don't. Right. right. But yeah, this is a dumb trade. But it, yeah. it's just dumb. All right. Great. Can I ask you guys a question before you guys leave? What do you think Detroit would draft this year? Uh, with what selection do they have? Fifth? I think they have the the fifth or sixth. Let me see. Uh, I think we had Jerese Walker in our mock. Yeah, we had Jerese Walker. Uh, I I think Cam Whitmore. Um, may you know? I think they're the two top picks. You know, I think the Thompson twins are probably in play. Grady Dick is probably in play. Uh, Taylor Hendricks. Uh, I think Jerese Walker or Cam because you've got yeah, the yeah. set. You've got you've got Ivy. You've got Cunningham. You get a Whitmore who's a little bit more offensively focused. You get a Jerry who might be more defensively focused with Dern in the middle. That's an athletic as hell team. And either of those two wings, that team is young and they're big and they're athletic as hell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that team does need shooting. And so Cam Whitmore, you know, that's one thing that that team lacks, especially if they get rid of Bogdanovich. Okay, guys, uh, we got to wrap up the NBA. It was good seeing you, Doc. Have a safe flight home. We look forward to you getting back up here. Uh, with Jake and I up here in the Philadelphia, New York area. 
And uh, now we're going to finish the uh, first round of the mock draft. All righty. So we're going to move on to our mock draft. This episode, we're doing picks 15 through 30 uh, with basically the same crew. Today we have Cam and we don't have Booney. So um, uh, once again, I lead off. Because I have the Hawks and I had so, so they have pick 15. And I'm going to say, you know, as I looked more and more, you know, I saw Jordan Hochefino, that, that was the selection. I saw him play, oh man, probably at least 20 times this past year. And I was really impressed with him. But he's one of those guys, you know, the you know, when you really watch him closely. You're not so impressed. And so, you know, in hindsight, after making this pick, I think despite the Hawks' need for, uh, you know, bigger guards, guards that can play some defense, uh, they don't really have a, a good a backup point guard. With Murray and Trey Young, you know, both playing, they don't, I guess they figured they didn't need a great uh, backup point guard. They had Aaron Holiday on the roster. Uh, but he's a free agent. I, I doubt they're going to put a lot of effort into re-signing him. So I went with Jalen hood Shafino. But as I said, I think I should have gone with uh, – so probably he's gone with the best available player. That's the other thing with Atlanta's roster. When you look at it, they have one of those rosters, and Cam could probably back me up on this. They have one of those rosters you like saying, well, they got every, pretty much everything you need but yet they can't seem to get to the next level. Um, so it's I'm not sure what's wrong with that team, um, but anyway, so Hood Uh He was the Big Ten Rookie of the Year. Uh, he also earned third team Big Ten honors. His overall statistics and his metrics were not that impressive, though. The, the most impressive number he had was he averaged three-point uh, seven assists per game, which was 10th in the Big Ten. But at the same time, he had an assist turnover ratio of 1.3. Not good for a point guard. In his defense, he wasn't the point guard to start the season. He was also a true freshman. But when Xavier Johnson went down, I'd say maybe a third into the season, um, he had to take over that role. And he certainly had some brilliant games, you know, over that span. Uh, he had like 35 and two assists against Purdue. He had 25, 21 and five versus Michigan, 33 and three versus Northwestern, 21 and nine versus Iowa. Um, he also cut down on his turnovers as the season progressed. Um, and he had, you know, in their final game of the season, he had a, a had a good game against Miami, uh, of 19 and three. Um, so what do I like about him? Well, he has ideal size for a point guard. He's a good athlete with a good handle. I, I don't think he's an exceptional athlete, uh, but I think he's a good athlete and good handle. Uh, he's very good uh, with pull-up jumpers, uh, and, and that's really what you I think is impressive about his game. By the way, I didn't say his measurements, but he was uh, he's 6'5 with a 6'10 wingspan. Um, and... With his pull-up jumpers, uh, he, he's very – you know, you want to have a guy who can pull up running the pick and roll. And uh, he made 42% of his uh, mid-range attempts this past season. He also did well in isolation, which is a little surprising, which I'll get to later. Uh, but it was a small sample. But he ranked at the 94th percentile for points per possession as an ISO player. He's good with floaters and runners. But I think he takes too many. A lot of them are difficult shots. Um, and I think he has a very potential, uh, great potential uh, to be a pick and roll handler. Um, he also has good defensive potential. You know, he moves well laterally, plays with his hands high. Uh, but at the same time, he's he often, you know, slow to react to a ball handler's uh, initial move. But he does have the ability to recover well. Uh, he does a nice job navigating screens, which a lot of guys don't. Uh, but I would like to see him go over more. You know, that's the easy way out when you go under. Um, and I'd like to see him go over more. But in general, I think he's, you know, uh, well above average in terms of dealing with screens. 
So what don't I like? Well, he relies a lot on jump shots. 66% of his shots this year were jumpers, and he only shot 33% from deep. Um, his shot looks pretty pretty sound, uh, so I think you know he can improve upon those numbers. His turnover rate was bad. 17% turnover rate is high. Uh, he passes with either hand, but he's predominantly a right-handed passer. So he doesn't really have that ability to make plays with, with both hands. Uh, and many of his turnovers come from just bad passes, lazy passes, or passes that shouldn't be thrown. They're just too tough to complete. Uh, and when you factor in, as a pick-and-roll score, he was at the 67th percentile. But when you factor in passing, he drops all the way to the 30, 41st. So he's definitely not an elite passer, which is something that makes you question his ability to play point guard. He also didn't play well in transition this year. Again, due to turnovers, 25% turnover rate um, as a uh, transition player. He also struggles at the rim and relies, as I said, relies too much on runners and floaters. He ranked 31st percentile uh, at the rim for points per shot. Um, he has good body control and he can finish with uh, either hand, but for his size, he doesn't do a good job of finishing through contact. Uh, he also, because he takes so many jumpers and so many uh, uh, runners and floaters, he only gets fouled 8% of the time, which is really low for a point guard. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really surprised me, you know, when watching him play after play after play is he really doesn't have a lot of dribble moves. It's like that pull-up jumper or nothing. You don't see step backs. You don't see sidesteps. You don't see turnaround fadeaways. It's just the quick pull-up jumper, and that's it. Um, so he's not really a, a creative, dynamic score like that. And lastly, you know, for someone who played 33 minutes per game, he was miserable in terms of uh, steals and blocks. He averaged barely over one combined between the two, playing 33 minutes per game. That number for 33 minutes a game should be at least two. You should be averaging a combined one steal and one block together, some combination. So uh, basically, you know, I think if, if I didn't take if I didn't take him at this point in the draft, he would have probably fallen into the middle of uh, the twenties, maybe even the late twenties. I'm going to be moving him down my board for our final draft board rankings. Uh, I still think he's a good player. Um, I'm just not as excited as I. The other thing is he's going to be twenty before the draft, so he's not like an eighteen or nineteen year old freshman. He's going to be twenty. Uh, when the draft takes place. So any thoughts about uh, Hood Shafino? He's a player I actually know Booney, if he was here, would, would uh, probably take exception to what I said. He was really high on Hood Shafino. Um, and so was I. So was I. But with, with further inspection, I have my doubts. Yeah, I, I really like him. Uh, the thing that I worry about in terms of like a, a team building perspective is I don't know if he's a combo guard or if his best route is sort of the point guard distributor role. Right. Right. Um, Cause like you said, he's, he's not quite like he, he's far from an elite passer. He can make some really nice highlight plays, but I think the, he struggles with finding the correct pass out of rotations. And that's where a lot of those turnovers come from. Um, I, I kind of worry if he's more of, you know, a combo guard that can give you some defensive minutes, kind of like a Gary Harris. And if that's who he is, he's, he's kind of undersized. He's not really, you know, has enough burst athletically to really fit into that role. Um, that would be one of my concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree. His lack of being a great shooter and um, and the lack of being, you know, a great passer, you know, certainly brings into the question of, you know, where does he fit? 
Um, so yeah, um, yeah, a, a pick I regret in this mock draft. Uh, yeah, I would much rather get him in the late 20s than uh, the mid teens. So moving on, Booney has joined us just in time for his pick, uh, for the Jazz. The guy I probably should have taken for Atlanta and then figured out uh, maybe trade <coughs> Clint Capella, <coughs> I think, would be the option there to trade Clint Capella. Um, but I didn't. And so Booney chose Derek Lively for the Jazz at number 16. What do you like about Lively? And what don't you like about Lively, Booney? I mean, you know, it's interesting. If I got these picks and I have the Jazz, I didn't realize how much they got out of the uh, trade with when they got rid of Gobert and uh, uh, Gobert mostly, and what they got, uh, what they got back. But you know, first we get Grady Dick. Now you're looking at Derek Lively, who reminds me of a Ru Rudy Gobert uh, defensively, as far as how long he is, uh, what a, a kind of rim, rim protector uh, he, he he's going to be in. What that do? Uh, 7 2, 235. We got to remember something about Derek Lively. When we were talking about Derek Lively, he was the consensus number one high school player in the country, and everybody on every single draft board had him going top five. But the first 10 15 games of Duke's season, he was hurt. When he came into his own, uh, he, he struggled a little bit. And then all of a sudden, the last 10 or so games, he really, really instituted himself as probably arguably the best defensor, defensive player in the country. When you're talking about Derek Lively, you're talking about this elite athleticism, a shot blocker. And one thing about Derek Lively that he has shown in his workouts is that he can shoot the ball a little bit. Now, fundamentally sound, he is there. At Duke, he wasn't. He was only 2 of 13 at Duke. But he has stepped out. He has been able to shoot the ball um, uh, in, according to his workout. Um, we really don't know what he can do on the offensive end. And we saw him against Tennessee get a little bit exposed against Tennessee physicality. Um, so, but for him dropping at 16, or the Jazz not having something like this. He has to be in the right system. He has to be in the right fit. I love Utah Jazz getting a younger Rudy, Rudy Gobert at number 16. Right. I, I, yeah, I, I would think he's more athletic uh, than Gobert. The, uh, uh, I don't know, probably more athletic than Kessler, who they already have on the team, but they don't really have um, – somebody behind him and I guess you know it wouldn't be uh again you know I always think it's best to draft for talent anyway and then move people around and not so much worry about you know need so um yeah um interesting stat that I, I found on him and we talked about this during the regular season when we were talking about, about him when he was struggling uh he really did get off to a slow start and kind of looked out of place uh, but, uh, anyway, I, I grew to like him and, and I agree with much of what you said, but, um, one of the, the crazier stats about him is he made 76, 77 field goals this year. 58 of them were dunks. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, Jake, you're a dookie. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I love this pick uh, to, to pair with Walker Kessler and play him at the same time. <clears throat> Uh, you can play lively while he's off the court, but I think there's uh, there's a lot here defensively. Not only is he a great shot blocker on the ball, but he showed the ability to slide over and and uh, and and make make blocks. He gobbled up pretty much every rebound at the end of the year, and like look how much better Duke was of a team mm -hmm. when he got on the court and he started playing uh, consistently and and finally got healthy. So I really like this pick. You added a jump shot that looked good at his pro day. Uh, good point by Booney there because he. He, it, it did look good. He was making a ton. Um, and I think there's a little bit of passing here, though. I think there's a little bit of, like, short roll and and uh, and, and post-passing here as well. So, lots of like uh, about Derek Lively. I, I It wouldn't shock me at all if he went lottery, if he went a little bit higher than this. 
Yeah. And, you know, you know the way, I, I think he plays such good defense that even if he doesn't develop anything more in, into a role man and, you know, a cutter, um, I still think he'll be a very valuable player, you know? Yeah. He's NBA ready now. I don't know about that. I think he's, uh, I mean, we saw Zach. He has been. Well, Zach Eady <laughs> really beat him up. I know that was early on in the season, but, um, yeah, I, I just can't get that. Zach Eady just pushing him around uh, out of my mind that image. So, yeah, but he's got they got Kessler, so they don't have they wouldn't have to rush him. All right, so with the seventeenth pick, uh, Jackson is picking for the Los Angeles Lakers. Who are you taking, Jackson? Ah, uh, yeah, for seventeen, I have the Lakers going with uh, Kobe Bufkin out of Michigan. Uh, I don't know if a ton of people will be familiar with him because one of the bigger names out of Michigan would probably be Jet Howard, obviously Jordan Howard's son. Right. But um, Kobe was actually, I think, the lead playmaker more so for Michigan this year, um, set up a lot of the offense. And I think actually a lot of the offense ran through him more so than Jet, even though he was more like, at in the preseason, more high, highly touted yeah. Um, yeah. prospect. Yeah. Um, He's also a sophomore, but I believe he came in early as a freshman. So his age is about what for a freshman as the same. Yeah. Um, so I really liked him because he showed that he could play on and off the ball. Um, actually, for percentile wise, 90 sec 92nd percentile at the rim, which I found really impressive. Um, really good finisher for um, going off cutting, driving. I think uh, a lot of the sets he they ran out of him was the pick and roll and handoffs, and yeah, as I said, uh, great finisher at the rim, he can finish with both hands. Um, also, eighty first percentile in transition, and I really liked his game as I think he was good at making a lot of uh, decision making as the lead play playmaker for Michigan. Um, good mid range shooter, eighty six percentile. And while he's not, like, the best defender, I still think he's a solid, smart defender. But um, he is only, I think, at the combine, weighted at 186 pounds, uh, around 6'4", 6 6'5". 6 so can I, can, I, I, not, can I stop you right there? The funny thing is, last year, he looked like a stick with two sneakers. You know, he looked like a stick man with two sneakers. He's actually bulked up a fair amount. Okay. So, yeah, I think... Well, yeah, if he's so then he shows the ability to put on that weight then and then so I don't think it'll be as much of an issue as people are saying, even though now he's still only about like one eighty six. Um but I think that he can improve his, the consistency of his two point jump shot. Um I know a lot of the times he was playing on the ball in Michigan, even though they're a pretty disappointing team. But I do think at the NBA level he'll be able to play on or off the ball. And I just think he could do a little bit of everything, which I think is good for the Lakers in that they will most likely resign D'Angelo Russell. I don't know about Schroeder, but um, I think they'll be able to play him um, at the combo guard and then pick up some point guard responsibility as well. And I think he really has high potential because of the fact that he could do everything and the fact that he can get to the rim very well finish. And if I think if that jumper develops uh, I think he only shot like 33% from three on about three attempts. If it jumps to like 38, he could be a really good player. And I think right now he could help them and then he could grow into an even bigger player in the future. Yeah. Um, Buffkin uh, didn't test well at the combine, but, you know, that surprised me. Um, I mean, when you watch him, I, I would say he doesn't, he doesn't look like uh, a, an elite athlete, except for one yeah. thing he does. It's pretty damn unique, especially for his size. He gets a lot of blocks when he's beaten off the bounce. So a lot of times you'll see centers, for example, a lot of centers will actually let the guy go by on purpose. And then they will turn around and whap it against the backboard. Well, Kobe Bufkin does that. I don't think it's by design, but he really is explosive off the ground. But he didn't test well at the combine, not even for vertical. So maybe he was under the weather that day or whatever. But that did give me pause. But one thing, one thing I really love about him is uh, he really is good in the pick and roll. He's not flashy, but he's good. And when he's 
he's he's kind of unique. He's maybe he isn't the athlete that I thought he was, but he always you know gets to his spots and he's very crafty. You know, changing speeds, going in and out. He's like a tireless worker with the ball as he's like kind of finding the space, this the right spot to take a shot. Um, he's kind of unique that way. Uh, he needs to improve as a shooter, I think. Um, but yeah, he's a good all around player, very smooth player. Um, the jump shot looks pretty. Um, surprised it doesn't go in more. Um, any other thoughts on Kobe Bufkin? I'm surprised he's going this high. I, I mean, I, I know where most people have him, I know this is about the right spot for him. Yeah. I just don't like him. If, if I'm a GM, I don't pick him in the mid first round. That's all. Yeah, I have him a little lower on our draft board. Uh, you know, I have him in the, the mid to low 20s. Um, so I agree with you there. Um, I actually, you know, I, I did kind of a compare and contrast with him and Hood Shafino. Uh, and I think I came away liking Kobe um, more. So, but so, but it wasn't so much that I wanted to move Kobe up. It's more like I wanted to move Hood Shafino down. Yeah, it's and, just well, Kobe. One thing I love about Kobe is he does have he does have all those moves that uh, Sh Hood Shafino doesn't. By the way, Kobe is younger in, than Hood Shafino, um, even though he's a sophomore. But you know his dribble moves are very effective. He can shoot the fadeaway. He can shoot the slide step. He can shoot the step back. Um, excellent body control at the rim too. Um, I I just think I don't know if he's more athletic but he's more skilled. Yeah. All right. So now we'll move on to pick number 18, and that's Cam. He's picking for the Miami Heat, who just uh, wrapped up, you know, what a run they had, you know, being so undermanned. Um, so, Cam, they, they need a little help. Where, where do you think they need help the most? Yeah, so with the 18th pick, um, you know, Miami, I think, is pretty clearly going to be looking for somebody that's going to be ready for rotation minutes, if not right away, but very early on mm -hmm. um, in their career. And, you know, generally when you're looking for guys of that type, you're going to be looking for guys that are steady defensively, generally older players that have a little bit more experience. And I think just about the perfect fit here is Chris Murray. Um, one thing that Miami was really lacking in terms of fit was an additional um, guy with 6'9 plus size. Um, and Chris Murray has that. He's about 6'9 in shoes. And he's got a just a hair short of a 7-foot wingspan. Uh, pretty solid build. Um, and I think uh, he is that rotation-ready sort of piece. Right? He's going to come in very early on um, as a versatile defender. Um, he can give you some shot blocking in a pinch. I wouldn't call him a rim protector, but he can help out in rotation. Um, but I think defensively, one of the things that I really love about him is his pick and roll, de his pick and roll defense and IQ. Um, he can mix it up in a variety of different looks on that play type. He can come up to the the exchange of the ball at the pick at that level. Um, he can even drop if need be. He should be re relatively switchable. Um, one concern I have there is his foot speed, um, at least laterally, but he's a really intelligent um, in terms of pushing guys to the baseline, pushing guys into help, and again, will sort of let guys ole past him and come back with the block over the top. Um, and one thing that I really like about Murray and, of course, his twin brother Keegan is that they're both developmental guys. Um, out of high school, they had next to no offers. They actually did a prep school year, and that's why he's one, one of the older prospects in the draft. Um, he's uh, he, he's really an example of, you know, he came into Iowa. His brother was a star. He was kind of a, you know, a backup, essentially. Um, and in this past year, he really has shown um, some huge developmental leaps in terms of his shooting, although, you know, it's not overly consistent um, just yet. But, I mean, he's putting up 20 points a game um, in the Big Ten. That's not that's not easy to do. Um, you know, as far as weaknesses, 
Obviously, age for many teams would be a concern. I think for the Heat, it's a little bit of a strength. You're looking for somebody that's ready to play, already has that fully developed body. Um, he's not an elite ball handler. Um, at Iowa, he really shined as a post player um, and was in the 91st percentile for post scoring. Um, I think something that that's something that he's going to really need to address because I think offensively he really shines as somebody that can perform as a big defensively, but um, move out to the wing and mix it up um, using his size and strength in that way. Um, again, the three-point shot, it's a little bit streaky. He had some games where he would go, you know, 50% uh, from the floor from the three, and he would have games where he would shoot three of 13. Right, there's a lack of consistency with that jump shot that he's going to have to continue to refine. Um, but I think a guy that can come in uh, and play some rotation minutes for a team that is lacking in size. All right. Any any comments on uh, on Chris Murray? The, the one thing you know, uh, and I think Ken pointed this out. You know, the one thing that the major difference between him and Keegan is shooting. Um, Keegan's just, you know, has been statistically a better shooter. Um, so, you know, do you, I I personally wouldn't expect the same because, you know, basically the Kings use Keegan as kind of like a, you know, three and D guy. So I think there's going to be a, a bigger transition for Chris. Would you agree, Cam? Yeah, I think the the inconsistency with his shooting is is going to be a little bit of a struggle at first. But again, like it's especially in terms of where I'm selecting him here, like the Heat are known for their development. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to get those reps, and I I don't think like mechanically he doesn't really have any glaring issues. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I think he, he's going to start pushing up towards that 40% mark. And again, it is at 33.5%. It's not, you know, that's not a shot that you would disrespect or just totally leave him open. Right. And he's right. going to knock him in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah, think I he was doing, I think he was doing better. Uh, I, I think he kind of uh, tailed off toward the mm -hmm. end of the Big Ten season. Yeah, yeah, he struggled later on for sure. Um, yeah, and I think I think where he is a little bit different from Keegan in a, in a maybe a positive way is that you can slot him in at the four mm -hmm. and feel very comfortable with his strength, with his length. I think whereas Keegan, you know, the the Kings kind of slotted him into that three and D wing spot because he was kind of getting pushed around down there. Um, and Chris is much. Uh, he plays with like a really strong core. He's going to kind of push guys around, and he's not going to get overwhelmed with size. Right. So I think that that's kind of a, a benefit to the way that he plays. Okay. Pick nineteen, Golden State Warriors. Drew, who are you going to take? So the Warriors, uh, I think this year really highlighted with some of the issues that this team is having. Um, first and foremost, I think it's size. Uh, when you're your biggest player on your roster that's getting significant minutes, it's a 6'9", maybe a 6'8", Kavon Looney. That's problematic, especially when you play a big Lakers team. And they've really struggled to figure out the youth movement. Uh, they've had all these high draft picks. The core is getting old. The young guys are not developing the way that we would have hoped. Jordan Poole took a step back. So at pick 19, I have the Warriors looking to address both of those issues with Noah Clowney out of Alabama. Uh, right off the bat, I look at the defensive upside. We are looking at somebody who is super long. He has athletic ability to match his hustle and anticipation. He competes on defense. I like the motor and the effort that he plays with. He only averaged two and a half fouls a game, so he's not just hacking people despite having a thinner frame. He wasn't an elite shot blocker by any stretch, but again, I think he plays hard. He tries, and that to me accounts for something. Using He's not afraid to make himself big and play in the paint. The scoring mechanics inside the arc did look sharp to me. Uh, he cuts to the rim with purpose. Uh, Rich, we talked about he's 89th percentile on his cuts. And I really like about this kid is he looks to dunk the basketball. He plays big. We talked about Victor Wembanyama and how sometimes he gets too fancy. For a thin big like this, 
I want you to have two hands on the ball and look to flush it every single time. It's going to help limit the amount of times he gets pushed off his spot. He'll draw more contact, hopefully get to the line more. Um, he does finish with either hand fairly well. Uh, I, I didn't think it was an issue when he did have to play a little bit more finesse. Um, and he's a solid rebounder. He's not dominant despite his length, and I think a lot of that's just, again, due to his thin frame. But he still averaged eight a game. He had nine games with double-digit boards. Uh, so there was definitely a willingness to crash the glass. I look at other bigs in college basketball that I would expect more from rebounding-wise, and I think Clowney has surpassed some of those guys, in my opinion, as somebody who at least is on the glass, on the boards, at a pretty efficient clip. The thing that's most tantalizing about this kid, I think, is the shooting stroke. I've seen the term stretch big tossed around with him, and his shot does look good. From a mechanical standpoint, he's got a high release. He's big. He's long. He looks comfortable when he steps out there. It's not like there's no awkward hitch. He doesn't seem to have a major hesitation. But that's where the issues, when I look at weaknesses, start to come in. The shot looks pretty good, but the statistically, it is not. He was 28% from three. I think he's settled for the three ball pretty often. Uh, he had 18 games this year where he shot the three four more times. And another thing that, you know, Richard pointed out is when you are in a limited role on a team and you're not good at something, you should not be taking that as one of your primary offensive tools. He was a limited player. Offense ran through Brandon Miller on this team and all their guards. So for a player that might only get seven to eight shots, I don't want a 28% three-point shooter shooting four threes when he's only going to shoot the ball eight or nine times a game. Um, he did have a couple of games where he got hot against uh, South Dakota State. He hit five. Uh, he had a stretch in the season where he hit, I think, at least one in like three or four games straight. But it's still not completely there. Um, and it's also, I think, an issue more repetition-wise and maybe mentally because he was a poor free throw shooter too. He was 65% from the line. Didn't get to the line a ton despite playing big. And again, I think a lot of that is he was just kind of a sparingly used piece in terms of their offense. He had to find his buckets in a more organic way, like cutting to the rim or offensive putbacks. They weren't running sets for him. I think the biggest question, there's two of them for me. It's A, it's going to be his frame. Can he put weight on? Can he continue to build his body? He's really thin. And in today's NBA, where we're seeing kind of a resurgence of the true center, like an Embiid, like a Jokic, like a Carthony Towns, that can also space the floor. He's going to have a hard time physically matching up with those guys. And even matching up with some of these overpowering forwards, like an AD, a Giannis, a Sabonis, he's 210 pounds. Uh, I have no doubt that I think he can build his body, but early on, that's going to be an issue. And then I think there's an overall lack of true, I would say, basketball skill. You know, can he add depth to his game to be more than just kind of a rim runner and a long athlete? You know, there's shooting questions that I've talked about. You know, there's little to no playmaking statistically from him. And again, I know that that wasn't asked of him. But I still would have liked to see flashes, moments where he caught the ball, maybe he got doubled and kicked it out, or made the right p or made the right read, made an extra pass. I didn't really see a lot of that. It was him relying a little bit more on just his raw athletic ability and hustle, which is fine. But when you play for a team like the Warriors, what's the thing about Looney they love the most? It's the rebounding and then it's the passing. It's how he sets screens, it's how he runs their offense. If Clowney can develop that element of his game and add a 35%, 36% three ball, build his body. This is a great player to help kind of, I think, give the Warriors that boost in length and athleticism that, athleticism that they need. They missed on Wiseman because they thought they were getting the next Anthony Davis. Clowney projects to be more probably like a John Collins or a Clint Capella type role where he can hopefully stretch the floor. He's a little bit thinner, but he's athletic. He can hopefully develop into more of a shot blocker. But I think that he's the right mix of what this team needs with the upside in what you want in a mock big, but he's going to have to develop because right now he's really more of an athlete and a hustler than he is a really good basketball player. Right, right. And he wasn't asked to do a lot right. at Alabama. He was a, right. definitely a complimentary piece. Um, so any any comments on uh, Clowney going to the Warriors? All right, so now we'll move on. We have a run of power forwards here. So at number 20, uh, the Rockets are up, and that's Booney's uh, on got on the clock again. Booney, who you got the Rockets taking? So what's interesting about the draft position right now, and as you mentioned, the power forwards available, at this point in the draft, for me, there were really two bigs left, and Noah Clowney and who the Rockets are going to take, and Leonard Miller from G League Ignite. Um, if Drew did not go with Clowney, I was going to take Clowney at 20. 
Uh, and the best way to compare to when I'm looking at those two individuals, I think Clowney is more of a safe pick. Uh, it's all more of a solid player right now than Leonard Miller. And on the flip side of that, I feel Leonard Miller has much more of an upside. When you're talking about Leonard Miller, you're talking about somebody that is completely raw on both the defensive and offensive side of the floor. And if the NBA was simply a transition game, Leonard Miller would be a lottery pick. Unfortunately, it is not. And while as impressive as he looked in transition, he looks that dismal in the half court, in, on the half court side of the floor. Um, he's 6'10, 210, 7'2 two wingspan. He's young. He's only going to be 20 years old in, uh, in, uh, in November. Um, I think he has the potential to turn into somebody like Brandon, Brandon Ingram. But in order for that to happen, his jump shot needs to improve drastically. He shot 32% from three, 40 league night while averaging about two, three the game. Um, although he shot 55% on the floor, which tells you how effective he was in the paint. Um, I'm not sure about Leonard Miller. It's going to take some time for him to develop uh, into a player. But if he does develop into that player and into that jump shooter, I think you you have yourself uh, a 6'10 Brandon Ingram. Yeah. Um... It seems like we've been talking about Leonard Miller forever, but yeah, he's still only 19. Um, I think the best thing you could say <clears throat> about him is how he tested out the combine. Um, you know, he had uh, a standing vertical, 32 inches, a max vertical of 37 and a half. Um, he was probably, you know, if you look at all the tests, uh, this year, of of anyone who was like 6'10 and above, he was clearly probably the best athletic performer. Um, the problem that we had with Leonard Miller last year when people were talking about him as a first-round pick, a lot of those problems still exist. Um, his shooting stroke is still awkward. He's a lefty, um, by the way, uh, which has nothing to do with his shooting stroke being awkward. I'm just pointing that out. Um, but you know he uh, he has the ability to put the ball on the floor, but a lot of times he ends up kicking it around. Uh, defensively, um, you know it could be comical sometimes watching him play defense. He just does. He just so many times he's just in the wrong place. He just doesn't even seem to know how to switch right. Um, so um, yeah, you, you you watch him play defense, and so many times you'll see him double teaming. Somebody he'll be on a double team. Somebody doesn't have the ball. <laughs> yeah, no, no question. I mean, he is he is completely like I said. He absolutely looks clueless out there sometimes. Right. But you know, you get him out in transition and running out of wing. You're like, oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what's a little frustrating with him uh, because again, you know, being a Warrior fan, I was looking at who the Warriors been taking. I'm like, it's gonna right. be Clowney or Miller if they want to be that. And. Um, you know, uh, no, you you were definitely right. I mean, he definitely wouldn't fit with a Golden State. Clowney would definitely be a better pick than that. Uh, Miller is one of these guys. You know, he's probably he's probably going to be all or nothing. Um, and like I say, he's still only nineteen. He's got the physical tools, and we'll see. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, moving on, we have Jake has been so quiet. We've never heard Jake. Be so quiet ever. Uh, but he has the Brooklyn Nets who are on the clock with pick 21. And I'm muted. Okay, now I'm not. <laughs> I have the Brooklyn Nets taking Keontae George at pick number 21. I watched this Nets team. You know, they made the big blockbuster trade. Uh, to give away Kevin Durant, and then they made the big trade for Kyrie Irving, and they're you know they look like they were a dumpster fire. So they, they the whole roster kind of gets reshaped. They bring in Mikael Bridges, one of my favorite 
players in the league, my favorite Villanova player that I've seen. But they need scoring around him, and they need some youth on this team. Spencer Dinwiddie, Seth Curry, Joe Harris, Patty Mills. Like they need, I feel like they need some youth, and they need some scoring because outside of Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson, this team struggled to score versus the 76ers. And Cam Johnson's a restricted free agent. So I'm going to go with Deontay George here, who I believe is the best pure scorer still on the board. This guy can make difficult shots. I, I think he's a way better shooter than his shooting percentages suggest. He's got a really good release. His footwork is awesome. He's always able to get squared to the basket very quickly. And he only needs a sliver of daylight to get a shot up. He gets fouled a lot and can still knock him down. I thought he navigated screens very well in terms of trying to score. Uh, I think there's some playmaking potential here because he does navigate screens well, but can feel a defender behind him, use a sidestep or, or a pullback move. And he, he just he has a bunch of different ways to get himself open and get himself open looks. Gets to the free throw line a lot, too. So his explosion, I thought, could have been better, but at his pro day, it looked like he had slimmed down a little bit and looked like he could get up. So I'm no, I don't really worry too much about that. But if you have a guy who gets to the free throw line a lot, and shows explosive ability to finish over guys. I, I certainly like that translating. And the thing I'll give him credit for is he does not he's not shying away from contact. He's not taking necessarily like bad shots sometimes where he just gets kind of stonewalled by big. Like he's gonna take it into your chest and and try and finish through you. Um talking this footwork on shots, but on drives too, like uh Euro step combos and stuff like that and, and moves to Maybe a hop step. Like he he's got very very good footwork. But uh, again, to, to get himself open looks, whether it's jump shot, it's at the rim. His footwork is is very very good. Weaknesses though, defensively, um, which is kind of weird because when you think of a Baylor guard, you would think that defense would it would be defense first. Uh, inconsistent at at times. Now he did average over a steal, but at times can play too high. Guys can get past them. But he he also showed like. Really, really good lateral movement. It could close out and stay in front of guys, too. It just kind of varied by game sometimes. So, you know, putting all that together uh, is certainly going to be big in, in his transition to the NBA. Obviously, he can take tough shots, but it's almost like uh, when you have a guy who, who is so prolific and can make difficult shots like this, it almost is like a quarterback, like with a John Elway type huge arm that will try to fit a ball into a window where there's three guys there. It's like you have a guy like if he sees a couple go through the net, like he's gonna he's gonna put them up. He, he'll put up deep threes, he'll put up some bad shots, some tunnel vision at times uh, can hurt him. So decision making, defense, uh, we're inconsistent. Got to get better. And I, I brought up his explosiveness uh, during the season. I thought it could have been better, um, but it looks like he's slimmed down, and that's that's not going to be uh, much of a problem anymore. To be quite honest with you, so. Nets need some scoring. Deontay George is the best scorer on the board. They need some youth at the guard position, and he's going to fill that. Yeah. Um, interestingly, they uh, – and his name's going to – oh, no, I got his name. Uh, he's – I think he's a lot like Cam Thomas. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think he's just kind of like Cam Thomas. So now it's like, okay, you've Deontay George, Cam Thomas, Mikhail Bridges, like maybe – and Cam Thomas uh, hasn't really played, like, no. that consistently. I would like to see that happen because, like, that, you know, he, he was – if you have a Keontae he, – like, he was basically Keontae George in his draft class. Like, pure scores. Cam Thomas was up there for the best, like, if not the best in that class. Right. But I agree. Well, you Keontae George, and remember for the first about 20 games, 15, 20 games of the – college hoop season, he was considered the next guard right after Brandon Miller uh, as far as prospects. Uh, I think at 20, 20, at 21, this is an absolute deal uh, yeah. for the Um I think he potentially has, has the potential to be one of the top five uh, prospects that end up being out of this class. I like him a lot. Yeah, what, what happened, and I forget the nature of the injury, but he suffered an injury and I think he missed like maybe a game or two and then he came back. But after that, his numbers just went into the toilet. Um, so yeah, he definitely struggled down the stretch and his uh, efficiency took a hit statistical efficiency uh, and Baylor went down with him. Um, so yeah. yeah. 
I, I actually think uh, he could be, um, unlike Cam Thomas, I think he has more upside as a playmaker. Uh, I think Cam Thomas is probably a better shooter. Um, and But I, I think uh, Keontae George has more uh, point guard potential. All right. So uh, now we're going to switch gears and go to Jake. Because <laughs> the Nets... Uh, are picking also back to back picks. They also have picked 22. So now who you got for the Nets? Yeah. So continuing with, uh, with kind of the guard movement here and, and bringing some youth there because they have some that Nets have Nick Claxton, they have Bayron Sharp, some younger, uh, big guys. I'm going to take Nick Smith Jr. here. So one of the best or one of the highest rated high school recruits in last year's class had an injury and had to miss a bunch of time. Obviously, there was a, it was a good Arkansas team that that had, you know, Jordan Walsh and Anthony Black and Devo Davis. Like they they had a bunch of other guys where, you know, he wasn't necessarily the guy. Ricky Council, he wasn't necessarily the guy when he was on the court. He would play with a lot of other good players, um, and then the injury and everything. But I'm going to go Nick Smith here, uh, with with potential, with just pure talent. Um, disre- kind of disregarding the injury because I, I don't think that's going to affect him that much. Let me go Nick Smith. Uh, did not turn the ball over a lot, which I liked. Um, I wish he would be faster, making reads in the pick and roll. I feel like he missed guys at times and, and could be a, a faster pick and roll decision maker. But honestly, lot to like here. Really good catch and shoot guy. Great extension and a, and, a, and a nice high release, good positional size. The thing I love about him and probably his best attribute on offense, this guy's touch in the mid-range. He can pull up very nicely, but it's run on runners and floaters. He has very, very good touch when he can penetrate the lane and can get inside. Now, to, to counter that, can he is he going to be able to finish at the rim? Is he going to be able to finish all the way against the, uh, to the rim? I think he needs to add a little bit of strength, and that goes both ways because if he got a switch and had a bigger guy on him, you know that he was usually going to give up points. So I think strength will, will help him both ways. Um, Although I don't, I gotta be honest. I don't really love including that sometimes, because like everybody can use strength. Shit, I gotta add strength. You know what I mean? Like everybody could, everybody could. Um, but it, I think that would help him finishing. And then if he, it, for a, a guy with nice size, if he gets switched onto a bigger guy, would would help him there. So, uh, he's a, he's a good off ball creator in terms of getting shots up. And and you know with his with his runner with his, his ability with his floaters and his runners and the pull up. You know, he, he's got good off-ball ability, but would like to see him, again, quicker reads in the pick and roll as a as a guy who can handle the ball. But regardless, um, I, I, I there's a lot to like here. You know, pure talent at pick number 22 for a guy who kind of got robbed of playing a full college season with that foot injury that kept him out and he was training in L.A. and like wasn't even kind of on campus. I don't know how that works. Um, I think this is a good pick for the, for the Nets if we're just kind of going on like, your talent here, young guy. So uh, this next guy that you have coming up, Rich, I think is certainly in play here. But I went with Nick Smith uh, to bring some youth, um, to give the Nets some youth and give them a ball handler as well that I feel fits a need. Yeah. Um, he, I believe, was the third rated uh, in his recruiting class behind Lively and Whitehead. Mm-hmm. And when I watched him before he – came to Arkansas, I saw, you know, a really explosive all-around score, you know. Um, And also I saw a player who I thought could play some point guard. Um, We didn't really see that in Arkansas. We didn't see hardly – we didn't really see that dynamic shot-making or the dynamic playmaking. I guess I got two questions for you. I mean, is it just because he didn't play a lot and and he was hurt? Um, and 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 I'm not I'm not questioning your pick. You know, I think it's worth a chance. But um, of course, you know, we didn't see him at the combine either. He chose not to participate. But I guess my question is why why do you think we didn't see that stuff that we saw in high school? Uh, and also, you know, what position do you think he ultimately is? So I, I I think the the hope is he can play he can be a combo guard. 
Um, I don't think it's the end of the world if he becomes a shooting guard that can knock down catch and shoot shots and create for himself a little bit. Now, I think the injury hurt him a little bit to the point where he couldn't really get into a rhythm because, like I said, this is a good team that was competing and they had plenty of depth with, with Council, Anthony Black, and Devo Davis. Like, there was... But there they was, certainly could have used somebody who could have shot. And, yeah, well, that's for sure. He just, just zoned them at times and that was, a, you know, they, they, they were stifled on offense. But when you when he played with an Anthony Black and a Devo Davis, and especially Devo Davis, you know, being a, an experienced guy that they won playing the one, um, and then the way Anthony Black played this year, I think that also is part of it. It's hurt, can't really get into a rhythm. There's guys playing well ahead of him that they're not going to mess up whatever chemistry they have, um, and you know are, are going to work him back in gradually. So I think there's a couple different factors as to why. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I. I Right now, it looks like shooting guard, but the hope is that he can be a combo guard for you with nice size, though. Right, right. And for someone who at one point in time was top five on our draft board, um, can't argue about the value of getting him here uh, in the early 20s. Especially, you know, I, I figure the Nets will do exactly what you did. I think they'll take a known commodity and then they'll take a flyer, you know? And um, on somebody with a lot of upside. So that's kind of what you had them doing. And even Keontae George, we may have not seen the best of him, you know, because like I said, he got hurt toward the end of the season. All right. So I have, uh, first of all, going to announce some trades here. And um, so what we, we had two in-house trades. I mean, trades that we did for this mock draft. And we also, there was a real trade, um, and that won't affect what we're doing here, but um, two trades will affect what we're doing in this round, and especially the next pick, was as the Pacers having five picks, I sent two of them, 29 and 32, to Portland, owned by Drew, for pick 23, and a second rounder, uh, Via Portland has multiple second rounders last week or last next year, including Atlanta. So that's the second rounder I took for next year. Remember this, Drew. You owe me a second round pick. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we also had the Hornets, uh, who are owned by Jackson. Jackson, you have the Hornets? Yeah. Uh, and they sent pick 34 and 39. So they also had, I believe, five picks to Utah, who had three, um, I believe. And they got pick 28 from Utah for picks 34 and 39. All right. So um, you know that some of these uh, teams that have – four and five picks are going to make some consolidating moves like this. Uh, and so after those trades, uh, I got for the Pacers pick 23. And I must admit my eyes were on Clowney, um, but he was not available. So um, I chose Bryce Sensible and I'm, I'm actually uh, very excited to get him at this spot. Now, Sensible injured his knee and missed uh, Ohio State's last few games. And he just, about a week ago, was cleared for basketball stuff. And so he is able to work out for teams now. Um, and what kind of shape he's in, I have no idea. Uh, he's a 6'6", 235-pound 35 guy. He's Charles Barkley-esque for sure. Uh, he has seven two wingspan. He's only nineteen, um, and at Ohio State, he uh, made the all freshman team. I, you know, personally, I would have given it to him, the uh, freshman of the year, over uh, Hood Shafino, but Hood Shafino got that honor. Um, he had an excellent season. He averaged sixteen points per game, forty eight percent from the floor, eighty three percent from the foul line. Uh, effective field goal percentage of 55.4 and a per 26.4 and a plus minus of 8.6. All of those ranked in the top 10 
of the Big Ten. He also averaged 5.4 rebounds per game and shot 41% from deep. So, and he did all this only averaging 24 points per game because early on in the season, uh, Chris Holtman was reluctant to start him. And ironically, Sensabaugh ended the season with the fourth, fourth highest usage percentage in the nation. So, uh, but only played 24 minutes per game. Um, so, what do I like about Sensabaugh? He plays with speed and power. And he doesn't uh, lack confidence, and he doesn't mind contact. Um, he's a three-level scorer uh, for points per possession. He was 86th overall percentile-wise, uh, but he's yet, not yet elite at the rim. That's one thing he has to work on, but he's not bad either. Uh, he's well above average on most play types, including, you know, isolation, uh, uh I'm trying to see here what else. Yeah, iso isolation in the post, uh, coming off screens. Uh, and his true strength is shooting. Uh, he can shoot from anywhere, and he's very effective from all distances. Uh, he loves his turnaround fadeaways to the point where you wonder, I mean, I know it's a tough shot to stop, uh, but he does it so much. He's like, don't they know that's coming? Um, but I guess a turnaround fadeaway, I don't know what you could do except double team somebody. Um, so he was 81st percentile as a jump shooter, including 82 percentile uh, off the bounce. So you have a big guy who can shoot. Uh, he came into college with a reputation as a bad defender, but from what I can see, he plays with effort and physicality. Now, there are some issues, which we'll get into. And he's also a very good defensive rebounder for his size. He ranked 11th, you know, for a 6'6 guy, he ranked 11th in the Big Ten with a defensive rebounding percentage of 20.1. Now, what don't I like? Well, he's definitely not a primary ball handler, and he's somewhat of a black hole when he does get the ball. He averaged just 1.2 assists per game, and his assist turnover ratio was just 0.6. Uh, he struggled as a pick-and-roll handler. Um and he clearly favors driving left, uh, and he's better going that direction, but he's a right-hander, remember. Um, defensively, definitely some issues. He lacks fundamentals. He seems to lack instincts. He tends to bite on different types of fakes. He's easy to fake out. Uh, he can get lost when switching and helping. Takes bad angles. A lot of times he runs straight into picks. Uh, doesn't produce many blocks and steals, only 1.5 per 40 minutes. And as I mentioned before, you know, for 40 minutes, that number should be at, at least a you know, bare minimum two. So he does not really a defensive playmaker. Uh, this is something I, I've never said about a player before. And I will say he doesn't draw many foul calls. I'm not going to say he doesn't draw many fouls because I've never watched a player and thought so many times, like, he just got fouled. You didn't call it. He just got fouled. You didn't call it. And then on the defensive end, it's just the opposite. It's like, he didn't foul him. Um, so I, the refs, I thought, were really hard on him this year. And um, so, yeah, but uh, he didn't really get uh, have a high foul rate. I, I don't want to blame that all on the refs. It's just a note I made that I thought uh, he got robbed on both ends of the court. Uh, and lately, or, you know, most importantly, I think he has to look into dropping some extra weight. Um, and I think that would benefit his game in all different ways. But most importantly, this is his second knee injury. He missed his junior high school season with a torn meniscus. So now, and now we have this other injury, which we haven't heard exactly what it is. But, um, you know, as a heavy player, you're more likely you put a lot of stress on your feet and knees. And um, so I think if he gets in better shape, he not only would be a better player, but also be able to stay healthy. So any comments on Sensabaugh? Anybody like Bryce Sensabaugh or dislike oh. Bryce Sensabaugh? Absolutely love him. One also, one thing uh, you have to take into account, too, we averaged 16.2 a game. Um, he only averaged 24 minutes a game. 
right. and which was which is much more on the low end. Um, and the offensive burden was on him at Ohio State. Yeah. Still shot 48% from the floor with that type of burden on him. Uh, I like sense the ball a lot. I, I think you make a great point with regard to injuries um, and his weight. Is that weight going to equate to potential injuries, i.e. a Zion? Um, so, you know, I think it's a hell of a pick. I think he's a heck of a ball player, and I love the way he scores it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty much a lock that he's going to be a good scorer in the NBA. Uh, yeah, I was, yeah. was going to say, Rich. Yeah, can he be a good defender? Uh, we'll see. Um, you know, and I think dropping weight will help him in that department. But I think, you know, he is just a born scorer, and he is tough to stop, and he can shoot from close, medium, and long. Um, so, yeah, somebody wants to score, draft him. The Warriors weren't so desperate for size. This is the guy I wanted to take. But the Warriors, like, they cannot forego big at this point anymore. Uh, I think that this dude is going to uh, – he's going to survive in this NBA because at worst case, he's going to be a bench scorer. He's going to be a guy that teams are going to be in that sixth, seventh role, man role. He's going to just come in, be a flamethrower, get you 10, 12, 14 points off the bench quick. I really like Bryce. Like a lot, a lot. I re- I was really thinking him over Clowney, but the Warriors just they need the size. Yeah, yeah. Um, now the seven two wingspan is unofficial. I contacted uh, Gary Pettit at Ohio State. Uh, he's their SID for basketball. Great guy, by the way. Shout out to Gary Pettit at Ohio State. Uh, and I asked him, you know, are those measurements in the ballpark? Uh, and he said that's what we have. So you know, I always you know, a little worried when I get numbers from schools because, like I said, they kind of get jacked up a little bit. But, uh, yeah, and he said he might be – he said to me, well, they might he might be lighter at this point. And I'm like, no, nah, I doubt it. You know, not coming off an injury. Uh, he's probably more likely heavier. Um, hard to lose weight if you can't uh, have a knee injury. All right, so we got pick number 24, Sacramento Kings. Cam, who you got? So I looked at a couple different guys here, but I ended up going with Jaime Jaquez out of of UCLA. Um, I really like what Sacramento is building in terms of sort of this high octane offensive team, but I think they need somebody that can still contribute on that offensive end, um, but really give them a little bit of a, you know, some scrappy defensive um, sort of DNA. Um, and I think that's just what Hawkes is. Offensively, he's kind of a do a little bit of everything type player. Um, his shooting percentages won't like blow you away. Um, and actually, like a lot of our stats suggest that he's not a very good spot up guy at all. Um, but um, I like the jump shot. And he, he's one of those guys that kind of has a knack for hitting the important ones. You know, down the stretch. Um, yeah. that Ask any Gonzaga so. fan. <laughs> yeah. Drew, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I mean, I got two buzzer beaters for a win to send them home. So <laughs> yeah. I'll take uh, – I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I, I like Hawkins, though. I, I do. I, I do like Hawkins. I think they do can play. But I'll take my yeah. two uh, Strother and Suggs buzzer beaters. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but, yeah, so, like, in terms of his, his little bit of everything um, – He's really – he's one of those guys who's a pick-and-roll abuser. Um, I don't think he's – he's not really a pick-and-roll player, but he's an abuser in that he'll look for switches. Um, he loves to take little pull-ups and floaters, um, and he's really good at rubbing his guy off on the screen. Um, he, he's always finding that separation, even though he's not – you know, somebody that's like blow by speedy. Um, also, he's a really good sort of short roll passer, sort of mid post passer. Um, he, he really has a he has a way of finding the right angle uh, with a nice touch pass. And I think that would fit in really nicely um, with the King's system revolving around Sabonis and DHF. Um, defensively, though, 
I really like what he brings to the table. He's kind of like, he's an irritant type defender, <laughs> right? He's always kind of poking at the ball. He's going to come over from the weak side and, and strip the, the post player. Um, and, and he kind of like, and I, I don't like to throw this around, but he kind of gives me some Larry Bird in terms of that, his defensive style. Um, he's not, he's really not athletic at all, um, but he has a way of using his timing, using his feel for the game to get into the passing lanes, find that poke, um, and and really, like, he's a nice shot blocker um, in a pinch. Um, he's also a really solid rebounder. Uh, 8.2 rebounds per game. Uh, and he also doesn't foul. Uh, only 1.9 personal fouls. And that's a, a lot of times they're just kind of throwing him at the best offensive player on the opposing team, regardless of whether or not they're a big or a guard. Um, so he's going to be somebody that's switchable, um, you know, with reason um, at the next level. I also really like his handle. Uh, he's kind of shifty. Um, he really uses his hesitations, um, minor crossovers to kind of separate. Um, and he really likes to attack a closeout. And that, that jump shot, we talked about the percentages not being super high, um, but it is respectable. He's not somebody that you want to leave open. Um, and if you're closing out late to him, he's going to attack you on the dribble um, and find some space for a layup. Weaknesses. You know, age is a little bit of a thing. Uh, but he's been, I mean, it seems like he's been at UCLA forever, like since the 90s even. I, I wouldn't be shocked. Um, hell, maybe the 70s with his haircut. <laughs> Who knows? I, I, I think he played with Walton. He, he, yeah, he might have. <laughs> he would have fit in with the wooden wooden days. Um, you know, it. He's he's kind of one of those guys who's going to be a popular player, um, just because you know he's going to be a fan favorite, right? He, he's you know, he's kind of got that plumber athleticism, um, but he, he's sneaky athletic in that way, right? He can kind of shock you every once in a while. You know, but that being said, he's, he does have that lower athletic ceiling, right? He'll he'll cram it every once in a while, um, you know. But for the most part, he's he's more of a ground bound floater, um, finesse finisher, um, and you know, like the shooting percentages. He only attempted between two and three a game in college, um, so he's really. It, it's hard to tell if that's really sort of a, an extension of how he likes to attack um, and find angles in the lane, um, more of a hesitant shooter in that way, or if it's really like his shooting mechanics, he's not really confident in that shot. He shot 31.7% from deep um, in the past season, 77% from the free throw line. So maybe there's a little bit more of a stroke there than he showed in college. Um, but that remains to be seen. Um, and, you know, I, something I worry about is, you know, a player that, uh, like, relies on pick and roll, when he gets to the next level, he's probably not going to be the first option. I, I mean, I would be shocked if that was going to happen. Clearly won't be the first option in Sacramento. Um, I doubt that they're going to want to take the hands out of the – take the ball out of the hands of their best players. If that's the case – what is his main play type that's going to contribute to winning offensively, right? Is he going to improve as a spot up shooter? Um, is he a cutter? Uh, is he going to be like a, a switch punishing post player? Uh, we'll see. But I think he, with the Kings, he's going to really fit in well with that sort of dribble handoff DHO style of play that they've developed there. Um, so I, I think I'm really excited about him as a prospect. I think I think any NBA team would be excited to get a player like uh, Hawkes because he's just a winner, does a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, you know he's going to give a hundred percent. You know, I, I love the guy. And you yeah. put up here. Uh, you didn't. I don't believe you said this unless I missed it. But you said uh, uh, shades of a beefed up Bruce Brown. 
And, uh, yeah. you know, he's definitely doesn't have the speed and quickness of Bruce Brown. And Bruce Brown has like some kind of amazing, like plus nine wingspan or something like that. It's, he does. It's, yeah. it's, it's insane. Um, but I will throw this in there at the combine. You ready for this? He had his standing vertical was 34.5. And in our database, which goes back to uh, 2016, that put him at the 96th percentile. So 39 max, too. Yeah, right. So 39 max. So, so that's uh, really nice. And, you know, that, I mean, he is a tenacious rebounder. Um, so yeah, I really like him. How about you, Drew? I know we we've talked about yeah. Hawkins a lot. We've uh, who was the other player we often compared him to? Is that... um, oh, was it Jalen Wilson? Was it Jalen Jalen Wilson? I was just about yeah. I really like Hawkins. Yeah, I think this is a good fit. the The shades I'm getting in terms of not necessarily the exact player, but the type of what he's going to bring to a team, especially a team that's still relatively young and starting to learn what it takes to win. I kind of, and again, this is not saying that they're similar basketball players, but I think of like Jalen Williams from Arkansas and what he's brought to that Thunder team, which is just that gritty, you need me to rebound, I'll rebound. You need me to switch, I'll switch. I'm a better athlete than I get credit for. Jalen Williams is faster than we give him credit for. It's why he's so great at taking charges. Hawkins has a much better vertical, like Rich just said, than we give him credit for, which is why he can get his shot off, why he's able to rebound well. And so I think this is the type of guy that a team like this needs. They need, this is what gets them over the hump. I'm not – you're right. He's not like, going to be – Like Bruce Brown got the nuggets. Like Bruce problem. Brown. Like like we're literally seeing these teams start taking these guys who – and Hawkins was statistically better than Jalen Williams was in college. I just really think this is the type of dude these teams need to start investing in in these late picks for teams that are looking to contend. You don't need a high upside guy. You need a guy that right now, Jaime Hawkins can absorb 10 minutes a game in an NBA game. Like right now, he's ready to contribute. And you're going to see that impact in this draft because now yeah. if you go over the cap, you are going to get nailed. And yeah. and so you need – you can't afford to have a bunch of these guys. Like You can't afford to have a bunch of Leonard Millers on your team. For you what can't. it's worth, this is the guy I was hoping he fell. I mean, I'm not – I'm coming with pick 29. I was kind of hoping just because of the age and that like, he was going to drop because – He's a winner. And look, how, how old? he's not that old. I hate the age argument because at the end of the day, it's like, he's what, 20? He's 22. 22. 22. Okay, he's Early actually, 22. He's younger than Chris Murray. Yeah. He is going to play for 10 years in the NBA and is a guy that I think is ready to contribute off the rip. He's going to have a 10-year career. And you're telling me that he's too old? I, I don't know. I really like this. Well, no, 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 no. In draft evaluation, age is huge, but not so much is what we got to say is if someone played exactly like Hawkes and somebody put up similar numbers to Hawkes, but they're 18 years old or 19 years old. That's what I'm saying. Then we have to think, well, what the heck are they going to be when they're 22 years old? They're going to be better, right? I mean, you get statistics show that you usually get better up to the age of 27, 28, and then that's when you start to decline. So at the same, oh, sorry, go ahead. At the same time, I was just going to say, at the same time, that guy doesn't get drafted in the thirties, right? I think that's kind of you know where Drew's kind of getting at there, right? Yeah. Right. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> under the cap now, under the new collective bargaining agreement, they are going to need players that can play right now. Okay, Leonard Miller can't play right now. Leonard Miller has a huge upside, far higher than Jaime Hawkins. But you can't afford to have a lot of guys like that on your roster anymore. Um, you need guys, especially contending teams, need guys. They got to invest in guys that can play right now. So, all right. Oh, well, yeah. And the beauty, too, of, of drafting some of these multi year college guys is you're going to have them under contract and have them under control for the next six years minimum, right? Especially taking them in the first round. Mm -hmm. You've got those options. You've got restricted free agency. The you're collecting a role player that you can hold on to for years. Right, right, right. All right. Um, so, yeah, excellent. Uh, so we Memphis Grizzlies, uh, run by Jake. Uh, he's uh, he's taken over the Memphis Grizzlies and has been working closely uh, with John Morant. 
Um, uh, what, what are you working with John Moran on uh, target practice? Or <laughs> um, it's a parade in my city. <laughs> Sorry, I keep I keep going on mute here. So, How about this? How about higher security? Yes, <laughs> higher security. You have plenty of money. I well, know no, that. He, he, did that. he did that in his okay. uh, his uh, body. Some of his bodyguards beat up a uh, a guy, a mall cop, uh, because his the his mother didn't like the way the mall cop talked to her or something. I don't know. Uh, or or oh, wow. yeah. Anyway, uh, so number twenty five, Memphis Grizzlies. Is this their first pick, right, Jake? Yes, yes, they have right. a couple second rounders, but with the departure of Dylan Brooks, wherever that may be, a lot of people rumored that it will be China and it won't be in the NBA. <laughs> but regardless, they're losing him. So I, I am going to give the Grizzlies another big forward who hopefully will make a lot more jump shots than he did in the playoffs this year. And I like Dylan Brooks. I don't want to shit on the guy. I like Dylan Brooks, Oregon guy. I love being Auburn. Those are some really good teams. Made the, uh, the one that made the Final Four, but felt like he got in his head a little bit and he started missing a lot of shots and didn't really have too much value. So I'm going to take Jed Howard from Michigan. Terrific, terrific shooter. Transition spot up off the ball on flare screens. Can read defenders well. His 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 shooting is is pretty prolific and pretty spectacular. Shot over 36 percent. Really good release. Fundamental shot out in front of, like, good extension out, out in, uh, you know, in, in front of his body. It creates space on a shot fake. And he's he's so good with the shot that I think the next step for him is attacking closeouts. Is, and not that, not that he can't do that good, but I'm saying, like, being a ball handler, getting all the way to the rim, using that shooting ability to your advantage that defenders are going to jump at you, lunge at you, get out of position. And, and, and be right up in your airspace, you're going to be able to get by people. I think that's where his next offensive progression is here. Show the ability to do that a little bit, to put the ball on the floor, to get all the way to the hole. Now, not a, a terribly explosive athlete who's not going to finish over you, so there is some concerns about finishing at the rim. Um, but if this guy can be as good a shooter as he showed, more stuff is going to open up for him as far as penetrating. Um, can make some basic reads, but not much of a ball handler right now. But, you know, with his shooting ability, hopefully that can continue to grow, and, and that's like the next progression for him. You, use your, your gravity as a shooter's advantage to you. Uh, defensively, not the quickest, like I said, not the most explosive, but this guy competes, fights over screens. Um, you know, he, he um, if, if there needs to be a switch, you know, he can, he can handle it a little bit, I guess, in a short period of time. But this dude competes on defense. And even if you don't have the physical attributes to be able to play on that end, if you compete, like we, we can we can certainly work with that. Um, weaknesses here, I, I mentioned that his 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 jumper is awesome, but that's where most of his shots come from. So you know, can he be a good enough defender where he can be a three and D wing in the NBA? I'm going to bet on that because his shooting ability is that good. You put him on a team that's already got Desmond Bain, that's got Luke Kennard. Let's add another shooter in here. And a guy with some size that's going to provide a need to Dylan Brooks on the way out. Um, so, yeah, really, really good shooter here. I think you're looking for a 3 and D player at this late in the draft. I think you'll certainly take that, a guy who can play a role like that. Grizzlies have drafted pretty well. They got David Roddy who's playing minutes for them this year. So, I'm going to roll Lofton, uh, Kenny Lofton scored 40 points with the season finale. Yeah, oh, I love his game. I, I, <laughs> I hope that something works out where he can play for them. His game is awesome. I want to see Zion and Kenny Lofton on the same front line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got to ask you a couple questions here, Jake. First of all, we have Kobe Bufkin going ahead of Jed Howard, as Booney pointed out. I believe, um, you know, Jed Howard was ranked uh, well above Kobe Bufkin until say the last month or so. By most draft boards, including ours. Um, I didn't think because of the body that, that Jackson mentioned him being have a slight frame. I thought he wasn't physically ready, wouldn't put his name in. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I didn't. But who do you like better? I have an, I have an opinion, uh, but who do you like better between the two? So they're, they're certainly both good players that are worthy of being in the first round. I think Bufkin is more of an upside thing, even though they're both young. 
Uh, but me personally, like I, I do it. It's tough. Um, but I, I, I really like Jet. I, I, I really do. I really do like Jet. Um, is it, I, I just think that shooting is going to be able to translate right away. It's an, it, he'll have a translatable skill. He's going to be on a team with a lot of shooters. And then hopefully when they have John Morant back, like imagine you have a lineup where you put Desmond Bain, Luke Kennard, and you have Jet Howard out in the court. And then you have John Morant there, and, and then you play with Steven Adams, and you play with the center. Like right. you're talking about some serious spacing going on here. Right. So, and that, that could, that could, you know, open up, obviously open up lanes for job, but just the, the threat of having such good shooters out there, I think would help them out and, and fill a need. So it's close. I am going to go with Jet though. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree that he has a skill right now that's NBA level and that's his shooting, by the way, 76% of all his shots were jump shots. He almost exclusively was a jump shooter. Mm -hmm. In terms of Bufkin and Jet, though, I, Bufkin, I think, does more things better, but Jet does one thing, like, at a pro level right now. Mm -hmm. Bufkin is kind of more Agreed. of a do-everything, and sometimes those do-everything guys don't do anything good enough to get on the NBA floor. My second part of the question is, Dylan Brooks was Memphis's dog defender. Um, why not take a guy like Andre Jackson here? I I was between those, like he was the other guy. I was between. I was between those two guys because you're absolutely right. Like they they could use a dog defender like that. I think Jet will still prove he at least is going to compete on that end. You know, it's not like you, there's no effort. Um, they needed a forward for sure. I was splitting hairs here because I have a guy with an Andre Jackson who can who can play make a little bit. Who can I I love his game personally. And I was splitting hairs here. Okay. I so it was it was between it was between Andre Jackson or or it was between Jet. I was really really well. The other close. thing is the guy who keeps his name keeps on popping up, Bruce Brown. They may have their eyes on Bruce Brown because you. He plays better defense than Dylan Brooks mm -hmm. um, and doesn't come with the baggage. Yep. He comes with rings, though. Now he's, exactly. got, one, now he's got one ring. So, yep. all right. So, we're going to move on to the 26th pick. This is a Pacers' original pick, not one that I got in the trade. Um, and so, I, uh, all this time for the Pacers, I keep on passing over power forwards, power forwards, but that is their biggest need. But I ended up with my fallback guy, a local guy, the Hoops Prospects College Player of the Year, Trace Jackson Davis at number 26, uh, 6'9", 240. By the way, 240. I never would have thought he weighs 240. Doesn't look it, does he? And a 6, or se excuse me, 7'1", wingspan, 33 uh, standing vertical, which is good. He tested well all around at the combine. So I'm going to try to not bore you, but, man, I got to read off some of these statistics. He, first of all, a four-time all, all Big Ten selection, four years, all four years. But this year, not only did he win Hoops Prospects uh, Player of the Year, but he also won the Carl, Carl Malone Award and – First team All American. Um, and this year he finished top 10 in the conference for points per game. And that was also 16th in the country. Rebounds per game. I, I'll read off the numbers 20.9 for points per game, 10.8 rebounds per game, which was seventh in the country. Four assists per game. Now remember, these are all top 10 Big Ten statistics. 2.9 blocks per game, fourth in the country. Field goal percentage of 58%, a per of 34.2, second in the country. Wind shares, 7.2, sixth in the country. Plus minus 16, plus minus of 16. That's like, woo, that's like overtime elite range. Uh, first in D1, that plus minus was. Uh, and I'll stop there. There are more stats that he was like toward the end of the top of the conference and also toward the top of the country. The only knock on Jackson Davis is Kenny hit a jump shot. He barely shot the ball outside of the paint at Indiana. 
partially because his coaches, he was so good at what he did, and that was score around the rim. Um, but to me, there is no doubt he will have a role in the NBA, and I'll tell you why. As I said, for somebody who's 6'9", has 7'1", wingspan, he's a good athlete. Uh, not Leonard Miller ath athletically, but he's a good athletic big. Uh, he's been consistently productive since his freshman season, and he's a proven winner. And get this stat, second highest total win shares in Big Ten history. So there you go. That's, that's a great honor. Uh, he's efficient score, 91st percentile for points per possession. And that's with or without including uh, passes. So interesting enough, he really wasn't much of a passer this year. And Mike Woodson got on him about passing. And you know what? He went from around 1.2 a game to four assists per game this season. He runs the floor really well, and he's good in transition. His the combination of his athleticism, size, and length make it and skill make him tough to stop in the paint. Also, had 73 dunks on the season, which tied for seventh most in the country. Um, but he's good as a cutter, he's good in the post, he's good as a roller. Um, and you know, he's pretty good in ISO too. And you're funny, you know, if you just watch his ISO plays. He's got more dribble moves than most people think of him because they're so used to him, you know, just doing the spin move in the post and reverse layup or whatever. I mean, he's got he's got some mad quick in out dribbles that he uses. Uh, he's got crossovers. He's got spin moves, uh, and as I said, much improved passer. He his assist turnover ratio better than his point guard. He had one point six. Uh, assist to turnover ratio, which was, uh, you know, as I said, Huchifino had 1.3, gets to the foul line often. Almost 20% of his possessions result in fouls, almost seven free throw attempts per game. And he's also a 70% 70, 70 uh, shooter from the foul line. Not great, but not bad. And, you know, the one thing I don't think, you know, gets talked about is he is a solid all-around defender. I mean, you think of the guys he's gone up against, Zach Eady, Keegan Murray, Luca Garza, EJ Liddell. I could go on because Big Ten is famous for its bigs, and he holds his own for sure against those. He lacks, you know, like most bigs, he lacks ideal quickness. Uh, to guard on the perimeter, but because he's athletic, because he has good length, he can erase those mistakes. Um, you know, by when the guy gets by him, he can catch him and swat it away. Uh, excellent shot blocker, as I mentioned, great defensive rebounder. Um, you know, he's very disciplined. You know, he's not one of these guys, you know, even though he's a shot blocker, it's not easy to get him off his feet until you actually release the ball. Um, you know, he rarely overruns plays. You know, you see a lot of guys that, like, take charge, you know, they charge out on the closeout and they just totally get blown by because they're just out of control. He doesn't do that. And he doesn't make the same mistake twice. You know, I would see teams, you know, go into the same play and where they got him the first time, they don't get him the second or the third time. Uh, and he's not just a drop coverage guy, too. He'll get in the stance have his hands out, you know, knees bent, and, and he will challenge people on the perimeter. Okay, so we talked about the jump shot, and that's, you know, that's the big thing. He only made 19 of 69 jump shots in his college career, 28%, and 0 for 3 from deep. That's all he took was three threes. Uh, he showed at the combine that he could shoot to some degree. He made 49% of his jumpers in various drills. That sounds really good, but the problem was, compared to all the other participants, he only finished at the 19th percentile. So he was still at the bottom of the list uh, because there's no defender, so it's obviously easier. Um, he has a fluid stroke from the foul line, but still, career 68%. Eh, you hope that would get better, but you know the fact that he's around that 70% mark, I'm thinking he's at least going to be a serviceable shooter. Uh, for a big. Um, one, one thing I'm really concerned about for somebody who's 23 years old is he's very left-hand dependent. Uh, he very rarely 
uh, uses his right to finish, and he heavily favors driving left. So that's something that makes him very predictable. Now, he's not going to be playing in the post so much, but even when he's not in the post, he still wants to go left. Um, you know, you usually, you know, some players can get by with being predictable like that, but mm, I don't know if a big like him can. Uh, and the other thing was he only made 56% of his layups this season. Uh, you know, he misses he misses a fair share, share of bunnies. If he can vary it up and use his right hand sometimes to finish, he won't be taking so many difficult left-hand shots. You know, sometimes the right would be much easier if he'd use it. So, all right. So that's my summary of Trace Jackson Davis. You know, a, a lot of people, mixed feelings about him. I mean, last year, people weren't even considering him as a second-round pick. And I think now he's worked his way in that end of the first, beginning of the second Anybody really not like him or everybody really like him or is this where he should be drafted? I Are we sure he shouldn't go higher? Well, I, mean, you know, I, I, I love his game. He, like, especially too, I feel like this draft is lacking in a lot of, like, traditional style bigs. Which is what he really is. Like, he's a little undersized for that sort of center role. But I'll tell you, he's one of the few guys I've ever watched at the college level that reminds me of Kenyon Martin. Where mm. he he's just like and I think like he could play a similar role in the league. Yeah. Right? He, yeah. he can be a ball mover, he's gonna hit the rim as hard as he can. Uh he's gonna rebound, he's gonna compete with guys that are bigger than him. And like the passing improvement this year, that's so valuable for and guys you know, that are going to fit in as sh as short rollers. He doesn't yeah. have to score all the time. You know what, Cam? Right. You know what was impressive about his passing? It wasn't just you know you're just you know just a. They were some tricky passes. You know, difficult yeah. passes. You yeah. know, passes that made you go whoo. You know, that's yeah. <laughs> Something I love about him too. He is a, like a, he's kind of like a a coast to coast sort of threat. Mm, like one yes. of the things that I think is really underrated about Draymond Green's game is the fact that he'll get a rebound and he'll push it himself to find guys. Right? He doesn't have to like he's not a, he's not a passer that um, like he, he's producing his own fast breaks. And Trace Jackson Davis would do that this past year, right? He would get the board. He would push that thing down the court, and he would be looking for those corner threats because he's so big. Somebody's got to help in. You have to address him driving in transition, and he's really great at finding those passes. Mm -hmm. yep. Can I just say, Rich, if Kevon Looney can be a starting center on a championship caliber team, mm. Trace Jackson Davis can be in this league and thrive. You Do know I what? think he's. A they have, similar, they no. have a similar game right now. Similar game, yeah. I, I don't anticipate him being even statistically as productive as even say like a Sabonis, where it's a little bit. But like, he's a he's a basketball player. Like that's like the best way I can describe it. He's just a good basketball player. And I watched Kevon Looney this playoff run and last playoff run really showcase the value in a rebounder, a big who has a good IQ, who plays like Cam said. When he's not starting a break, but can have that element to his game. So mm -hmm. there's no reason I think this dude shouldn't be drafted. I think he's a first round player. I could see him going even up a little bit higher for those teams that are looking like he can go even a little bit higher. We had that power forward run early in the 20s. I right. wouldn't be super shocked if a team, like we said with Hawkins, is like, you know what? I'm taking a guy that's a plug and play dude that can fill that four, maybe as my, you know, first or second, like first big off the bench. And then hopefully, as he gets into that fourth, fifth, sixth year, he can become my starting power forward. Yeah, that's just my take. I watch too many bigs in today's game to try to turn themselves into guards, and then I see guys like Looney and Sabona who are play like bigs and have success. To not think that one of the most dominant college players that I've seen in the last couple of years isn't going to at least be serviceable. You know, it makes me wonder. You know, Cam talked about him going higher. He, you know, Clowney. You know, Clowney is more ready than Leonard Miller, but neither of them are in Trace Jackson Davis's ballpark. Trace Jackson Davis could play 
20 minutes a game this coming NBA season. And I don't think Clowney or Miller are ready for that, especially Miller. So could Golden State think about him at 19? I wouldn't hate it. I, I wouldn't hate it. I know that with this purpose of the mock, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to combine both needs and our thoughts with what we think is going to happen, which is why, like, Clowney, I think we all agree Clowney will go ahead of him. Right. But based, like, on, based on potential. Based on, but if the Warriors walked out of this draft, particularly if they were to do some trade maneuver, maybe they dropped in the draft or whatever, I'd have no issues with that because right. he will address a lot of their needs and they can rely on him right away to be their first big off the bench. And and probably start in a couple of seasons, really. Right. But I think you're going to at least get journeyman production. I mean, like Looney. Looney is, I Absolutely. think, a great example. I think you'll get Looney-like production out of Trace Jackson Davis, uh, where Miller could, you know, Miller or Clowney might, you know, be like, me, I don't know about All-Star, but, you know, maybe. I see know, like John Collins, like a guy yeah, who could right, be in that right, 18, 20, right. still be like at the 18, other 10, 10 guy. But the other thing, if it is with those guys, they also could be out of the league in three years. You know? Yes. I mean, they're just not proven, you know? All right. So, all right. So, number 27 uh, is Charlotte's pick. And because of the trade with the Jazz, is 28 is also Charlotte's pick. Now, remember, Charlotte had five picks. Now they're down to four. So, for number 27, with their uh, first pick, uh, between the two, I have the Hornets picking Brandon Pachensky. I think that's how you pronounce the name from Santa Clara. Podzimski. Podzimski. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think the Hornets one of their biggest needs is shooting, and I think that he does that at a very high level. Um, I mean, Santa Clara relied on him for a lot of playmaking as well, but I think uh, uh in the NBA his most reliable skill will be shooting. Um, he's also pretty good finisher at the rim, but then when I was watching him, I think that his, uh, runner was one of the better ones I saw. He has a good touch and actually a pretty strong rebounder for a guard as well. I think he averaged almost eight, around eight points a game for a guard and, um, actually was able to score in the post fairly well, fairly well too. Um, some concerns though, I think he's. Athletically, um, this the measurements. He's six four with only like six five six six wingspan, so not the greatest measurements. Um, on the ball, I think he will struggle a bit as a defender because he's not necessarily as quick, or doesn't have um, as much strength as those we talked about somewhat for other guys. But off the ball, he actually was pretty good at um, racking up some steals at the West Coast Conference. Um, which is what we talked uh which is another concern as well, just being in the West Coast Conference, mainly not playing like the greatest competition, but he was still very productive there. So um yeah, I think the main concern with him though is just defense and finding who he's gonna guard because he's not the quickest and he doesn't have great length. But I think on the offensive end, he's still very solid, a great shooter. Um yeah, what do you guys think? Well, I, I was actually just looking over his overall all numbers. You know, he actually uh, was close to nine rebounds per game. And um, with without shoes, he's 6'4". So we'll say 6'5 with shoes. Um, he tested out athletically above average in pretty much everything. Um, so... Yeah, and and actually, by doing so, by being you know about sixty seventieth percentile in most categories, and by doing good in all things, that actually puts him in the overall better percentile. But um, I guess you know I know Booney's seen him a lot. I I, I figure Drew has seen him a lot, and maybe even Jake. Um, my question is one thing I you know as I was looking over his analytics that I thought was really odd was as a pick and roll handler in ISO. Uh, he was really good in those categories. And, but when you threw in passing, it dropped his efficiency pretty significantly. So I was wondering what you guys, cause he only averaged like three and a half assists per game. Is he a really a, a point guard or is he more of a combo guard? That's going to be like a, 
you know, start at shooting guard and then maybe, you know, is he going to play, you know, a little bit of both but not be a, a, a lead guard all the time? I think that's his ideal role. I don't know if at the NBA level, like at the WCC at Santa Clara, he was a lot of times just the best guard, if not one of the second best guard in all situations on the court. So you could get away with him. And he was their best player, like flat out their best player. You can make a very strong argument. He was WCC player of the year, given what he did versus with what he had versus what Timmy did with what he had. So I think combo is where he's at. He's the type of guy I would, you'd be very confident having them out there with a more traditional point guard because you know if there's a situation where the ball's in his hands, he can still initiate some offense, he can get his own shot. But at the end of the day, he's not in charge of everything. He's not dictating everything that's happening. Some of it is also the, the, the talent level he was playing with. You know, when you're asked to do so much and you're trying to create for the guys who aren't on your skill level, I think at times that just makes it where, you know, you're doing so much work and then at the end maybe not rewarded for even making the right read or the right pass because the guy just isn't up to par. Like you're playing at this level and the guy you're trying to, you know, elevate is at this level. Um, I really like Brandon. I've seen him play. Actually, fun fact, Menlo, the school I'm running ops at, uh, we actually played Santa Clara earlier this year like in an actual game, and we gave, we we almost got him. We gave him a bit of a scare. Brandon wow. didn't play great. He didn't play great. Um, they He turned it on from that point on. Uh, this kid is a freaking worker, man. All accounts from my head coach, their SID, their ops person, their, this guy is a gym rat. He is a worker, and I know, you know, there's going to be limitations because he's not a supreme athlete, and this is probably where he's going to fall in the draft is – I can't see him going much earlier than 20, and that's if a team gets enamored with him. But this kid works, and that's what you want from a player that's going to go here. Because I think, again, his jack-of-all tra- – at this part of the draft, that jack-of-all-trades ability, I think, is going to help him stick around. And he is the type of guy that will figure out what he's best at and will work tirelessly to try to develop a more concrete skill. But I think he's going to max out more in a combo guard. I don't know if I ever see him becoming a true point, which – I don't necessarily have a problem with because he has just enough playmaking and ball handling where I think he'll be okay in spurts, but maybe not for the duration of like a season or, you know, playoff run, something like that. Booney, I know you've seen him quite a bit. What do you think of Brandon? Yeah, I like, I like, uh, you know, like Drew, I like him a lot. Um, I think, I think the assist number is a little misleading considering who we had on his team. Um, Wasn't a whole lot of finishers on Santa Clara. He was the best player on his team by far. Uh, he was able to get to the paint. He was able to penetrate. He was able to play make. Uh, I 100% see him like a, uh, uh, a, uh, a combo card. And he was impressive in the combine game. Uh, he was one of the best players in both games combined. So he w- he showed the ability to play, make, uh, to play make and showed the ability to play at a high level against high level competitors. Right, right. Um, I think he's very, very good. And, and we must, we should add, he was the top, I believe, a top 100 recruit. Uh, he was a top 100. He was a and star. started off at Illinois, but didn't get any playing time. So, th- mm-hmm. so then he went to Santa Clara. So, pick 28, as we said, uh, Charlotte acquired this in, uh, uh, in a trade up deal with the Jazz in our draft. This is a trade that we did in house. So uh, what do the Hornets now do, Jackson? Yeah, so for their second pick in a row, uh, I also have them picking another combine standout, uh, Olivier Maxence Prosper. Um, I mean, he tested crazy well uh, athletically at the combine. Um, and then I think he played pretty well in one of the scrimmages. And then he, yeah. I think he just played the first day. And then, but from that, I saw the really hustle player probably will get any loose ball available um good rebounder and i think from what i saw as well during the season good finisher off the catch um can cut well um i saw you added uh, 86 percentile or above the 86 percentile in as a role man in transition and cut so he's going to finish well um i do think he could be a versatile defender uh he looks quick enough to guard um wings on the outside and big enough and strong enough to guard posts on the outside or inside um also he shot pretty decently well in college uh 33 percent from three and about three attempts per game but that'll be have to be a consistent skill for him to show in at the next level um a couple improvement areas he's 
certainly not going to be a playmaking threat for anyone else. Um, mainly a hustle guy will do well finishing off of others. Um, like I said before, improving that three-point consistency will make him a very well-rounded player. Um, but also on defense, uh, you put here 21% of positions he would foul. So No, no, no. Maybe, That's how often he was fouled. Oh, that's how often sorry. he yeah. was fouled. Yes. Yeah, that's why I, I threw that, that in there because that that number is like, woo! I yeah, man, that's really high to get fouled that's, at that rate. And I yeah. think he shot twelve in the one game he played at the Combine. If I remember correctly, he shot twelve foul shots in that game. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, it was like yeah, he shot double digit free throws in a Combine scrimmage. <laughs> right, you know. So I mean, it's just this guy just gets to the line at will. Yeah, so that actually just shows how aggressive he is on offense, not on defense. Actually. Right, right. That's right. Then. But there we go. All right. Um, you know, the thing that really shocked me about him is he was like the third or fourth scoring option for for Marquette this year. Um, a lo- you know, there were many games where, you know, he was pretty darn quiet. Um, but toward the end of the season, he really started to emerge, uh, especially when people caught up with that pick and roll um and and they were shutting down Marquette's pick and roll and and then they needed players to you know uh he showed the ability to create some though he doesn't he doesn't shoot much off the bounce he only took six of those types of shots all year but he still will take it to the rim um Jake I know you've seen the Big East a ton um so what what is your uh, opinion on uh Prosper yeah, so it's certainly a really fast riser, uh, but yeah, you gotta love his, his athleticism, his defense, uh, and if he can just hit threes at a at a consistent rate. But he's 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 got a little bit of speed in him to be able to get to the rim. Uh, obviously, you talk about the the high foul rate, so I re- I really like the different aspects of his game. It could be a you know I think the projection here is a three and D guy with a little bit more. Who if he ever becomes a a good enough threat that. I got to talk about Jeff Howard. People are jumping out of position. They're they're lunging at him. You really got to pay attention to him. You know he can use his athletic tools to to get downhill and make you pay for that. So lots of like here. Uh, the way they play, to, uh, you know, obviously they they play with their heads out like uh, their, their hair on fire on defense, and they're going to pressure you. And when you have guys like Omax, and he plays on a team that's got Igadaro who, who can who can block shots a little bit and can um you know is at least like a big, long, athletic defender, and they have that length to shrink the floor, like, this is a guy you want, um, you know, if, if, if you want to do that. So, like, the way that the, uh, the league is going, where you want you want guys like this, um, you know, look at what the Nuggets just did. They, they played three guys that were 6'10 or taller in the starting lineup and shrunk the floor on the smaller heat. So, if that's what you're going for. I, I like him. He's, he's a totally, really, really fast ride. I don't think anybody even thought he'd maybe get picked. No. No. You know, and then now here he is uh, with, with with getting tested and everything. But really, really good player. A lot to like here. Yeah. The the main knock I have on him, beside what Jackson said was passing, is like for somebody his size with his athleticism, he has never averaged better than 0.14 blocks per game. How How's that possible? I can get 0.14 blocks per game. <laughs> So that one that one puzzles me. You know, for a six nine guy with great athleticism, he just not a shot blocker. Um, but yeah. All right. So we'll move on. Where are we? Pick 29. Yep. I'm on it's, the clock with the Blazers. All right. Now this was part of our trade where I sent you two picks for one, yes. right? Right. Yes. So with pick 29, I have the Trailblazers selecting another UCLA guy, and that's going to be the freshman Amari Bailey uh, with the potential rumors that we talked about in the NBA section about them even looking to maybe move Anthony Simons. I actually like this pick even more because now you're filling more of a direct hole in this roster. Um, Right away with Bailey, I know early in the season, uh, way prior to, Rich and I were pretty high on him. We talked about, I think, Rich, you might have had him as your freshman of the year. Yeah, I changed candidate. last minute. I had Brandon that... Miller in the script, and I, <laughs> and I made, a, made a call to switch to Bailey. And I don't think, and in hindsight, yeah, okay, Brandon Miller would have been the pick. But I think there's a lot to like about Amari Bailey, especially late in the season. This is a guy who really came on. So right off the bat, the first thing is this is a solid athlete. He was good at the rim. He was good as a jump shooter, uh, particularly in the mid-range. 
Uh, his three ball was effective. Uh, it was a limited volume. He took right under two attempts a game. I believe it was like 1.8, but he hit it at a 39% clip. So even though it wasn't a super reliable weapon for him that he relied on, when he did use it, it was it was a pretty solid solid stroke. It looks good to me. Uh, at the combine, he was 16th overall across the shooting drills, and I think his average across the three stations was 61%. So he's definitely got a solid stroke on him, um, whether that's in the mid-range or out at the three-point line. He was a solid free throw shooter as well. Um, I think there's legit upside here as a ball handler and as a playmaker. He really started to flash his ability to pass in those final six games. It His season took off, and it sucks to say, but when Jalen went down, his season took off. Yeah. From those games into the combine, I know his assist to turnover ratio is negative, uh, just slightly. And he still had 18 assists to 15 turnovers, but it was a positive sign. He had multiple games in the tournament where he had six plus assists. Uh, I don't believe he had any against the Zags, but his scoring looked really, really good there. Um, he had 14 assists to only five turnovers at the combine play. And I think he does have a good feel for the game overall. He's not great in those half court settings in pick and roll just yet. But I still think out in transition, he was in the 84th percentile. He knows how to leverage that athleticism. He has a good feel to have the ball in his hands and make a quick split decision on the break, whether he's going to attack, whether he's going to look to kick to somebody else. Like I said, those final six games of the season, he was at 17 and a half points, almost five rebounds, three assists, cut those turnovers down to two and a half. So still problematic, but he showed those signs of improvement, which is what we want to see from a young guy. And I really like how he took on the challenge of playing for a veteran team with a you know a hard-nosed head coach. I mean, he was going to a program where, at best, he was going to probably be the fourth guy. And with Bono coming in as another five-star, he might have been the fifth guy. But he took that challenge on, was still effective. I think we look at the turnovers as a, as a red flag, and I think they should be. And he's right around what Hood Shafino had. I think he was at 19%, give or take, in the turnover uh, department, 19%. But, man, I still think he put together a good season. He was a double-digit scorer. He shot almost 40 to 50% from the field, almost 40% from three. He showed great flashes of playmaking. And you know what? I think this kid's a good defender on the ball. I think he knows how to defend, particularly that one or two. Clark went down, and he stepped into that role as their best perimeter defender. And I think he did so admirably for a freshman when it when it was crunch time. I mean, he literally had to go right into their conference tournament and, the, and March Madness and basically was told, you need to be our third best player and probably our best on-ball defender if we want to make a run. And he did that admirably. Now, where I'm concerned about the weaknesses, right away, he has turnover issues. And I think the speed of the NBA, NBA game is going to exacerbate that, especially early on. If he's having trouble with his, with playmaking and ball handling early college, that's probably going to be an issue at the NBA where the athletes are better, the experience is higher, and the, the general pressure of him having the ball in his hands is going to be more. He doesn't have a go-to bankable offensive skill. I think he's good at a lot of things. Like I said, he can get to the rim well. He can shoot the three ball okay. He's got a decent mid-range, but he doesn't have a bankable skill where like, you look at a Jordan Hawkins and go, that guy can shoot the ball. You look at, you know, maybe a, a Trace Jackson Davis, like that guy can finish at the rim. Bailey's kind of okay at a lot of things, not great at anything. He does, in my opinion, favor his left hand a lot. Even when he's, he might even initiate a drive with his right, but he always seems to try to get back to his left for the finish. And again, in college and high school, when you're maybe just a little bit better than people, you can get by with that. But in the NBA, crafty defenders are going to sit on your left, you know, left shoulder. Stronger players are going to just get up in you and force you right. You're going to have to find ways to fix that. And I think just the biggest question with this guy boils down to this. He's not experienced enough with the ball in his hands, all, all the turnovers and the pick and roll struggles to be like an on-ball guard consistently. And he's still a little bit streaky and inconsistent with it with it out of his hands. So there's going to be growing pains because he's going to be a combo guard, but he's got to figure out which side of that fence is he going to lean more to. Is he going to be more of the off-ball guard who's able to score, come off screens, be a bit more of a shooter? Or is he going to be a bit more of an on-ball guard who's going to be able to get to his own spots while also creating for others? With all that being said, I think at pick 29, I think Bailey's a really solid prospect. I still think he put together a good season that a lot of people have kind of pushed down because other freshmen have played well this year. And I think if this Anthony Simons news is to be taken seriously, I think he's the type of guy he can step in because at a minimum, he's a better defender than Simons is. And I really do think this is the type of dude who can have a floor where he could be like a 14 points, four rebounds, four assists type of guy later in his career, where he could either be a decent player in your starting lineup, like a solid starter, or a really good leader of your second unit where he's your first guard off the bench and is able to run offense for himself and others. Um, I like Bailey. 
I think he's got a pretty decent – if he can get the turnovers under control, I think there's a solid floor for a guy who can do a little bit of everything pretty well. Any other comments on Amari Bailey? I I just love his explosiveness and how dynamic he can be. And I think he's going to be a point guard. Yeah, I I think that upside's there. I really do. I think early on he's going to not be able to – like I said, I don't know if he's experienced enough to step into that role right away. But I think when it's all said and done, I could totally see him being a lead ball handler because he's explosive enough. And he ha- the feel for the game is there. He's just got to learn how to tamper it down and play within himself a little bit better. Right. And he thir- certainly was trying to show that at the combine. He played a total, oh, yeah. of, total of 50 minutes. He put up 36 points in 50 minutes. Also, 14 assists yep. and only five turnovers. Yep. And um, and he had the ball in his hands a lot. So, especially day one. Um, so, yeah. Shooting needs to improve. All right. So, we're almost done. We have one more pick in, in the first round. And that is pick 30 owned by the L.A. Clippers. Uh, and is this the only pick the Clippers have, I believe? Or do they have a second? No, I think they have a second in the 40s. Um, so Cam is running the Clippers. Um, what do you got, Cam? So, Rich, I'm going to try my best not to give you a heart attack while I go through this player. But <laughs> um, with the 30th pick, uh, the Clippers will be selecting G.G. Jackson from South Carolina. There were some high highs. For Gigi Jackson, I would say early on in the year, um, he was definitely creeping up boards very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, however, as the year went on, he really struggled. Um, and I think um, that's kind of a side effect of the fact that, A, he was a reclassified player. Um, so he's, he's actually the youngest player in this draft class. Came into a very oversized role um, for what I think he was really ready for. Um, at the college level, and he just so happened to do that uh, with a South Carolina team that is, uh, frankly, kind of mismanaged. uh, They're just bad. Uh, (laughs) Their offense is bad. Their defense is bad. Their shot selection is bad. They're just bad. Yeah. (laughs) And as a result, uh, that was kind of how Gigi Jackson's season went. His shot selection was poor. His efficiency is god-awful. Um, but if you catch Gigi Jackson on a good night, you see the flashes of his talent, his feel for the game. Um, you see the play types that he's capable of making, um, and falls short of with the, the finishing ability. Um, they actually used him quite a bit. I mean, this should show you how desperate that team was. They were using a six foot nine combo forward wing as a pick and roll ball handler. Uh, <laughs> And somehow that was his most efficient play type. Uh, he was in the 77th percent, sorry, 72nd percentile as a pick and roll ball handler. So when he was in that play type, he had enough of a handle, enough of a feel for that uh, pull up jumper of his uh, to, to manage some efficiency in that play type. Other than that, he really struggled at the rim. Uh, he struggled in post ups. Uh, he wasn't really used. All that much at all as a pick and roll man uh i think simply because they didn't have the guards to sort of take advantage of that uh play style um you know uh i put uh in my shades up i always do a shades up for a player um he reminds me of if you've ever watched the old pokemon tv shows in the commercial breaks they would put up a shadow silhouette of a pokemon you're supposed to guess uh, the player, or guess the uh, guess the Pokemon's <laughs> name. In this case, it, you can put up a, a shadowed silhouette of like any six foot nine, long armed power forward, good or bad, successful or not. Noah Vonley, sure, he could be that. Trey Lyles, why not? I can see it. Chris Bosh, maybe one day. <laughs> it, it, he's purely an upside pick. He's very um, he's very coordinated um, for a guy of his size, especially at his age. I mean, he's barely past 18 years old. Um, he's got some ball handling chops. He's got some post moves. 
He's a really um, sort of talented lob, lob catcher when he was in that play type in college. But again, we didn't see a lot of it. Um, and again, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the question really is, you know, was this struggle of a season for him an example of sort of him biting off more than he could chew at the college level? I mean, he had a 30% usage rate as an 18 year old. Um, is that an indication of he just wasn't ready yet and the issues also going on with his team? Or is that sort of a side effect of Gigi Jackson's play style, um, lack of um, commitment to developing his game, especially seeing as he fell off th throughout the season? Um, he also had some really public remarks about his intentions of transferring, his issues with teammates, his issues with the coach. I mean, he was just kind of, I mean, really just venting to the media. Um, you start to wonder, is this just kind of like a, a foolish kid that got in too much over his head and was sort of lashing out? Um, so I don't know. I, I love the upside. Uh, defensively, he could be a really nice piece. Offensively, he could be a really talented piece. But right now, he's far from ready, and he's going to take some development time. But um, I was thinking about it. If there's one thing that the Clippers need, it's some youth. Um, and they're, they're going to find that in Gigi Jackson. Let me ask you this. The one thing I think we should be debating is who's better? him or Leonard Miller. And I tend to go toward Gigi because Gigi's a year younger. Yeah, and I think I think he has a better feel for the game than Leonard Miller. Right? I mean, some of these plays, it was like, it, he's kind of like the opposite of Michael Porter Jr., where he's like, he's like a no, 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 yes player. Gigi Jackson's a yes, 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 no player. Right? He makes the, the sweet move a nice turnaround jumper, perfect time to pull up, a nice crossover, and then he goes up for the shot and he bricks it almost every time, right? It, he has the feel for the game, yeah. Um, but he hasn't put it all together. He needs a little bit of cleaning up with his jumper, uh, more experience. He seems but to does it, doesn't he look more the part than Leonard Miller, where Leonard Miller – you know, always has these moments where he's punting the ball in, you know, to the fifth row yeah. of the stands and totally. it has that weird shot, which actually isn't as weird looking as it was last year. Yeah, but still, weird. I don't think yeah, the issue think... with Gigi Jackson was uh, if he's ready. I, I think he's more than NBA ready. It looked like when he was out there playing, it looked like he didn't care. Um, he had, he took shots just to take him and made like, you know, like, like, he said it might have to do with him playing at North Carolina, at, at South Carolina. Actually, he was originally supposed to go to North Carolina. Um, he just looked disinterested uh, when he was on the floor. The only game he really was impressive was the showdown against Amani Bates in Eastern Michigan. Um, other than that, he just... He played he, pretty good against Alabama. Yeah, I mean, you, you he had games, a good game against yeah. Auburn too. Yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah. I like him. I, I didn't. I didn't. Now, of course, I didn't watch him. That Alabama game was probably the last time I saw him, uh, and I I think that was probably January. Um, but I never thought he looked disinterested. But the stuff Cam's talking about the the complaining, and I know he didn't he uh, get benched or for a game yeah, he or did at one point. Did he got he get at one, one game? Yeah. Um, so I don't think I saw him during that period. So maybe he quit then. But I would say from November through January, I didn't see him as a slacker. What 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 do you think, Cam? Um throughout the year, I think it got worse. Right. I think at the start of, uh, and a lot of times too, we don't see guys with sort of his um incoming pedigree on a team that just doesn't function. Right. right? That, that South Carolina team was Very bad. unusual situation. They were bad. Was. And, and, I, and, like, frankly, I would say they were poorly coached. 
and just like just the the type of shots they were getting, the type of offense they were running was just bad. Right. And they fired and, Frank Martin, who took him to the Final Four. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, I think it, it's pretty clear uh, like that that team has some guys on it that I that I like. Um, Mickey, and Jackson, Mickey, like he had, he had moments. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, Michi Johnson's their second best player. So you ain't yeah. going anywhere if Michi Johnson, your second best player. You want to talk about shot selection? Just pull up a Michi Johnson highlight video. <laughs> oh, okay. damn, Cam. It's, dude, legit, you're not, you're not wrong, but him. damn. He hits him, wrong. though. He does hit him. Uh, but yeah, I don't like it. It's hard enough in basketball to be committed. Like, like, so few guys are so committed to the team and to the game that they can overcome the adversity of just, uh, like, just bad circumstances or bad fit. It's even harder to expect an 18-year-old to come into a bad situation where the team can't defend, can't score, can't do anything. Right. And for him to go out and play his ass off every night. Yeah. Um, it's got to be, fr- be frustrating as hell. Yeah, but also if you're an NBA team and you see, oh, this guy couldn't even complete a full season in college and he's got issues with the coach and he's talking to the media, maybe that's a warning sign of, eh, this isn't the development guy for us. I don't know. At 18 you know? years old, we all do stupid things at exactly. 18. You know, I don't know. He, it was just a bad, bad decision. And I, I know his parents were a part of that. They may have even pushed him into it, you know? Yeah. Um well, you got to think too. Like, where would, where would, we, where would he be at if he had not reclassed, decided to come in a year later, or even like, like done what he had initially said he was going to do and transfer? I, I think this is a guy that has the talent to be in the lottery, and I think our draft boards throughout the year have shown that. Um, but you have to have, you know, you got to have the meat to to sort of back it up. You got to bring home the the bacon. And he did not do that in South Carolina. Right. That's why I, I, I still think, you know, when we're talking flyers, high potential, high upside, but just not ready, I would go with Gigi over Leonard Miller. And I'm not knocking your pick, Booney. I'm just thinking. I, you know, I, I, I didn't like the Leonard Miller pick. Uh, you know, I would. I, I would right, right. But at the same time, you know, considering where the pick was, he was the best available for what the Rockets needed uh, right. with that upside. And um, I thought it would have been, you, you know, it's a little silly at the same time if I'm sitting in the Rockets position. I was thinking Gigi. But then the thing, if I'm in that position, I could trade down to 35 if I wanted that. But in that particular position where they were, he was the pick. But I agree with you. I, I wasn't a big, I'm not a big. No, no, it, but I'm not knocking it. I, I, and I, I just keep on bringing him up because he, of all the players we've talked about today, he and Gigi are the two that are, are most like, these are the guys that are, are the gamble picks. These are the guys with the big upside. I mean, also Nick Smith falls into that category. Um, you know, so, uh, but. I think we're more comfortable with Nick Smith than we are with the other two. I think we think Nick Smith is at least going to be a a, a decent player. Um, where Gigi or Leonard Miller could turn out to be complete busts, or they could turn out to be possibly all stars. Um, yeah, remember the first half of the college season, uh, a lot of draft boards had Gigi Jackson on top ten. Oh yeah, we did. We yeah. did. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, player. Yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up the first round. Gentlemen, we'll be back in a few days to do picks 31 through 45. I want to thank you. And uh, Any final thoughts before we say goodnight? Yeah. All right, folks. That's it for today.